Mr. Reddick. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this hearing on the Committee of Gov Governmental Operations. I'd like to uh, share with everyone. Uh, we've been joined by Council Member Perkins and Council Member Marcel. Thank you so much for being here today. Today we'll be holding our first hearing for three pieces of legislation on three different subjects. The first will be introduction number 14, sponsored by Council Member Borelli in relation to the broadcasting of mandatory debates. The second is introduction number 828, sponsored by myself, in relation to an online list of required reports. And the third is introduction intro number 7, 48 in relation to certain taxi and limousine commission related hearing procedures of the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. I will describe the second and third bills in greater detail before calling out panels to discuss them. First, I want to thank the members of the committee, which I mentioned uh, two of them that are here already for the dedication and careful consideration of testimony. I also want to thank my office and committee staff who have worked so hard on the bills we will be hearing today, my communication legislative director, Claire McLavin, uh, my chief of staff, Greg Faulkner, senior counsel of the committee, Brad Reed, policy, uh, policy analyst to the committee, Elizabeth Cronk, and uh, finance analyst to the committee, uh, uh, Zachariah Harris. First, we will hear intro number 14, sponsored by Council Member Borelli, who could not be here with us today, in relation to the pro broadcasting of mandatory debates. This bill is, is, in a, is a reintroduction of a bill heard previously in December of 2017. The Campaign Finance Act requires certain mandatory citywide debates to be held, and these debates are often broadcast on television, radio, and the internet. However, the main broadcast sponsor may sometimes be, uh, may be a cable channel that is not available to all the residents of the city. Accordingly, this bill will require mandatory citywide debates to be simultaneously broadcast on the city television network. We have received written testimony on this bill from both the Campaign Finance Board and the Mayor's Office of Media Entertainment, in addition to the testimony they provided on this, this same issue in December of last year. We will therefore not be calling upon those agencies to read their statements today. Instead, instead, I will now ask if any members of this committee have any question for either of those agencies on intro 14. And if so, we will call the agencies out for the purpose of that question. And if not, we will move on to the next piece of legislation. And I see. Okay, all right. So I want to thank, uh, so with that, we'll go to, with no questions, uh, we'll go on to uh, intro 828, reports bill. We will now move on to intro 828, sponsored by myself in relation to an online list of required reports. This bill will require the Department of Records and Information Services to post their website as a list of every report, document, study, and publications required by law to be sent to the council or the mayor, along with a copy of such report. If a required report were not received by the department, then the bill will require them to send a request to the responsible agency and to post a notice to their website that such report remains outstanding. While the department does not currently post some reports to the website, the universe of reports posted there's, there seems incomplete and there is no notice if a required report was not received by the department. This bill will permit the public to know the full universe of reports and to access them. I will call uh, on the Department of Records and Information Services and the Mayor's Office of Operations to testify on this bill. Following this panel, we will ask the administration to testify in intro 748 in relation to taxi violation hearing procedures followed by public 
panel, and as they come, I want to recognize we'll also be joined by Council Member Powers, who has the power. I, I don't know if I do yet, if we're fine now. Yes, you do. <laughs> All right, so we are waiting uh, the Department okay, of Records and Information Service and Mayor's Office of Operation testify. Uh, and, uh, and we'll be having the sorting in. Can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. I'm gonna go for it. We're ready? Yes. Great. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and other members of the Governmental Operations Committee. My name is Emily Newman. I am the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and the rest of the Governmental Operations Committee for the opportunity to discuss the Council's reporting requirements. We agree with the Council on the importance of transparency in government and public reporting, and we prioritize these values. I'm here today to testify on the work that operations does in evaluating reports and advisory boards and to provide context on the landscape of reporting throughout the city. As you know, the Mayor's Office of Operations is charter mandated to convene and chair the Report and Advisory Board Review Commission, which is intended to, among other things, review current reporting requirements, assess the usefulness of reports, and make recommendations about reporting requirements that should be removed, consolidated, or otherwise streamlined. The charter requires members to include the Speaker of the City Council, two additional council members chosen by the Speaker, the Corporation Council, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, the Commissioner of the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, and the Director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. A memo standing up the Commission was sent to the Council earlier this week, and the Commission will reconvene in May. This Commission is a great example of the good government efforts in which operations engages, helping agencies maximize their time and impact, increasing transparency through open data and performance management, and improving customer service to the public. The Commission allows us to work with agencies and the Council to get a better understanding of the reporting requirements that currently must be adhered to routinely and to understand whether those reporting requirements remain a smart use of agency resources. In addition, the Charter already requires that mayoral agencies provide the Municipal Library with digital versions of all reports required by executive order or local law. We admire the work Doris does to help make sure reports are as available and accessible as possible. As you know, agencies work hard, often with limited resources, to meet their mandates while fulfilling numerous reporting requirements. Intro 828 would impose a new reporting procedure and inventorying requirement, creating additional administrative burden. With the continuous addition of legislated reports required of city agencies, we recognize the need to ensure strong administrative practices to support agency compliance. However, we do not believe that Intro 828 identifies the most effective approach and that it is not in the city's best interest to mandate a new process in advance of any relevant recommendations of the Report and Advisory Board Review Commission. Therefore, we cannot support the passage of Introduction 828 at this time. However, we look forward to continuing to work with the Council to identify a more practicable solution. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to answering any questions you may have. Hi. Um, so good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I am Pauline Toole, the Commissioner of the Department of Records and Information Services, which commonly is known as DORIS. And thank you for the opportunity uh, you've provided me to put in, give input on Intro 828, which proposes making additional information available about, about city government reports. One of the agency's three divisions, the Municipal Library, has begun to pivot from a brick and mortar research facility to one that increasingly offers digital content with the goal of building a robust online library by 2020. The foundation for this online library is the publications portal hosted by Doris, mandated by Section 1133 of the Charter as amended in 2003 by Local Law 11. 
The charter requires mayoral agencies to provide the municipal library with digital versions <coughs> of all reports required by executive order or law, as well as hard copies of other published materials. In 2014, the existing platform was virtually impossible to navigate, so we built a platform using open source code to improve public access. In previous testimony, I reported to the council that between 2003 and 2014, only 48% of agencies had submitted reports in electronic format to the portal. By April 2015, all agencies had submitted some electronic publications. At the same time, the library staff developed a list of all reports that agencies were required to produce and began a program of continuous outreach to obtain the reports. Due to these efforts, the quantity of submissions continues to increase. As of today, there are 21,059 reports that were submitted to the publications portal, up from 7,287 in 2014, and the chart in the testimony shows that. In 2015, we relaunched the newly developed portal with enhanced searching capabilities. Agencies submit reports along with metadata that enhances the search capacity, and we soon will be introducing a one-stop submissions portal for agencies to add reports and metadata directly to the site. This will further streamline the process of making the publications available to the public. We view the reports platform as a critical component in our efforts to build an online library and archive. And I totally understand the impetus for the proposed legislation under consideration today. However, we believe it's premature for reasons that have been addressed by my colleague from the Office of Operations. As you know, the Report and Advisory Board Review Commission will be convened shortly. We recommend that this proposal be held until the Commission completes its review. In addition, Intro 828, as drafted, includes requirements that would be onerous for Doris to undertake in real time. The legislation would require Doris to post a list of all required reports and include on the list a copy of the report, the frequency of publication, the date received, and the date the report will next be issued. Some agencies submit reports on a weekly basis, some monthly, some quarterly, and updating the list for each submission would require extensive resources and ultimately not provide the public with a really worthwhile service. Doris provides a searchable database listing all of the reports that have been submitted to the open data portal and updates the data on a regular basis. If deemed necessary, the data fields enumerated in the proposed legislation should be required on an annual basis, which would take into account all of the new reports required, and this data set would be better placed on the open data portal rather than the Doris website because it likely would be in a searchable database and not a PDF. The draft further requires that the list include a copy of the report which is not viable. The reports are already on the platform and available, so duplicating the post would require double the storage and access capacity. Similarly, posting an email indicating a particular report is not available would lead to a good deal of frustration for the end user because they think they're going to get the report and then they'll get the email saying there is not a report and that researchers don't like that. The searchable publications portal provides the public with reports by keyword, agency, date, and other search terms. Finally, the effective date does not allow sufficient time to implement any of the requirements. We would be very happy to work with the council on drafting a bill that might improve the accessibility of reports, incorporating the conclusions of the report and advisory board commission. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just recognize we've been joined also by council member Barron. Welcome. Um, I, oh, I was curious, uh, let me just start with, the, the, you have a advisory committee? Yes. And when was the last time they met? The last time they met was in 2012. 2012. Uh, we've just reconvened the group Okay. Um, by sending out a, a memo earlier this week. Okay. Um, we aim to have the first meeting in May. And why, why such a long span of, um, of six years? That's a great question. I can't really speak to the uh, to the long span. Um, I came back to the Mayor's Office of Operations in June 2017 as acting director, um, and I picked up on the work that had previously started with the previous uh, director um, working on pulling together this commission. Well, I'm glad it got started. Uh, obviously, <laughs> we're not happy that, that, uh, that we, we went almost, you know, almost seven years without uh, 
having that advisory committee because you know it does serve a function. Absolutely, we're anxious so to get it up and running. We think it'll provide a lot of value great. Um, in a lot of areas. Fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question then I'm gonna open it up to, to my colleagues. Um, a review by our committee staff found that the Doris website is missing several years uh, worth of report from some agencies such as Do It and Department of Buildings. And so we'd like to know why are these reports missing and how is the public supposed to know from looking at your website that, they, that there may be reports missing? Once again, it's a good question. We, as I mentioned, since 2014, we've begun working with the agencies not just to get current reports, but to harvest older reports. And it's an ongoing process, so we will be you know, constantly working with the liaisons and agencies to get the full set of reports. Um, in some instances, reports may have been given in paper copy because the agencies weren't yet ready to um, issue electronic versions, so we would have those. Um, it's a, a sort of different effort. Um, and, you know, I, I think when they, people are looking for reports, um, occasionally they're looking for an exact report, and more generally the researchers who come to us are looking for uh, information about subjects, and so they'll, they'll search those. Um, so, which goes to the heart of the matter of this bill, that there is no way so if I were to search, there was no way for me to know if, uh, if those reports are missing. So the general public wouldn't know that they are available in a hard copy, but looking at the website, they wouldn't know that it could be ready or available if they get it by hard copy. And so that's the part of the intention of the bill is to alert the public that you know, it's missing uh, and there's other ways uh, to gather this information. And so I, at the present moment, you don't have a mechan mechanism for people to be alerted uh, of, of your current situation? That's true. Okay, all right. Uh, with that, let me uh, turn it over to Council Member Powers. Thank you, thanks for, thanks for being here, thanks for the testimony. Um, I wanted to start with just some questions. The, I noticed that a, a really large jump in the submissions to the portal from 7,287 to 21,000 in the span of one, two, three, four years. Okay, I, I presume uh, we, do, we do a lot of local laws on reporting, but is there another reason? I mean, there, I, presumably there's more than that. I, mean, I don't think we passed 14,000. Uh, bills on it. What are there other reasons why that number has got, gone so high? Is it mm -hmm. is it more information being presented to you than the past? Is it more? I, I'm just be curious to know. Mm -hmm. As mentioned in the testimony, the librarians compiled a list of reports and then began working with agencies to solicit the reports. And going to Chair Cabrera's point, um, that effort elicited, you know dozens and dozens and dozens of reports and so we keep adding and growing um, and that's why you have such a large increase between 2015 and 2018 because the staff of the department began pursuing those reports. So it was like an increase in terms of going back and looking at reports that they were not previously were not previously captured by that? And, the and agencies between 2003 and 2014, agencies largely ignored their mandate oh, okay. to submit yeah. reports. Got it, so you're catch playing a little bit of catch up on terms of things. Yeah, uh, uh, quite a bit of catch up. Quite a bit catch up, yeah, I agree. And so there's right now there's 21,000. 59. 59 reports submitted through because of a local law or because of an executive order? The, the Section 1133 of the Charter requires that agencies submit all reports, studies, et cetera, that are required by local law, executive order, or state and federal law. Okay. So, so something that some the laws that we pass that get passed on. So um, that, that, that would be my starting point, which is to say, and I'm probably going to be the rare person in city council who said this, I think we are drastically asking the agencies to over-report. And I am like as big on transparency and, and as anything as anything. But when we make demands out of agencies to do their job in other ways, I do I do worry that we are adding in so much 
uh, onto them that is unfunded. Half the you know we don't fund new staff for that. We don't fund. Um, so I do welcome a, a con convening of a group on May to look at that. Not that we should be saying you shouldn't do your jobs that are mandated by local law, but that we should be improving the ability to do the jobs and looking at what laws perhaps don't serve a uh, reporting don't serve a purpose anymore at this point. Can I ask more about that uh, exact process? So what is it, how do you determine that there's gonna be a commission come any point in time? Sure. And, and what is the timeline on that and more information? Absolutely. Um, so it's, it's a charter mandate. Um, I spoke earlier about the participants. There will be three from the council um, as well as others from the administration. Um, and uh, the first meeting will be in May. Um, and at that time, we'll start to work on sort of the scope for this committee, this commission, to see sort of what we're going to tackle first and to develop a timeline. Um, so I think it'll take us a few months to have specifics on the timeline. Um, I can tell you some specifics on the commission. Um, it covers waiving or modifying any periodic report, commission, committee, uh, task force, or advisory body. Um, and according to the charter, it can review um, on criteria including uh, whether the reporter advisory board is useful for evaluating the effectiveness of a program, um, if an effective use, if it's an effective use of uh, management of city resources, um, if it's duplicative, if it remains relevant. Um, so there are a lot of things I think where um, we're in agreement on, um, where we want to look to make sure that what we've been tasked with doing still makes sense. A and then when you make that determination, what happens? So you're not, I, you, I, don't, I don't, I would assume you can't yes, it eliminate requires, a local law. It requires approval of the mayor and the council, um, as well as input from stakeholders. And there's and an annual- You will send us something that says yes. for our approval. Yes. And, and how, what did the six year period that uh, the chair noted, I, I think many would say, you know, how often should we be doing this? Um, how, what is it, why, what, what is the charter outline in terms of the frequency, or is this just it, the it mayor? It mandates an annual public meeting. Oh. Um, so, so now we have we been having them, every, we have them every day? We have every, not. Oh. We have not. The last meeting was in 2012, as okay. I understand it. So why did we decide today? I mean, then So we've been talking it. about this since, certainly since I came back to operations um, in mid-2017, and I know the previous director was working with the council on it prior to that. Um, so it's taken us some time to get it off the ground. We wanted to wait um, until early this year to get it launched. Um, and so now we're anxious to pull this group together and, and I think it's something that can convene regularly moving forward. I got it. And I would note that I, I do, there are, I mean, even like I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, I think actually some of the, I, even though I criticize the workload, I think actually some of the work that we've done and my predecessors have done, I haven't done anything, but uh, uh, have, has really been around. Uh, I think some of those reports actually have been very useful and will be right. very useful in terms of highlighting conditions within our jail system. And so um, the public having access to those, I think, are is very important. And so I share the goal of the chair, making sure they're accessible, available, and that the ones we're doing, I think where we share is the ones that we're doing are the most impactful ones. Absolutely. And so um, I would I would at least, if, if and not in this present form, you, got, you can be supportive of it, certainly with the committee and the chair, finding ways that we can we can um, ensure that the public has access to them. There's, I know, some good government groups in the uh, in in the in the crowd that would certainly appreciate having uh, access to information in a searchable format. I, I I recognize that the open data portal may be a bit better than a PDF, things like that. All things we can work out, but um, I would I do support the chair's goal of ensuring the public has access to those in a reasonable fashion. And I, I want you, you had a response, but I want to ask one more question. I think you'll be able to respond. Are we expecting that work that twenty one thousand to keep going up as you do more work? Like, what is we think is the what do we ballpark the final number at? Well, it's we do more work and you pass more reporting requirements. We expect the, we pass the numbers today, are going up. Which nothing is not today. a promise I but, can make. But also, I wanted to say, as anyway. you mentioned the, the reports required around criminal justice, and you know we've had a great partnership. We built a great partnership with NYPD, who is regularly like just providing all of the required information. So that's on the portal. It, it gets added to the portal regularly, and the PDFs are searchable. It's just that they're not a database. My, my question is really though, do we, uh, you're at seven, you're at seven, you're tripled. We probably the last won't have that same rate of growth. Okay. But it will be, it will uh, be steady, at, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilman Powers. And I, and I do share your, your sentiments regarding 
uh, having reports that perhaps we no longer have use for. It. So we want to use our manpower uh, in the areas that we could get the most output. So I share with them, we, we're already looking into that. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that issue up. I wanted to ask you uh, what other agencies are behind and giving you reports? Um, I don't have that information uh, readily available, but I could certainly provide it. What are you, from the top of your head, who else? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I okay. didn't prepare myself for that question. Okay, if you could give us that information. Um, you know, we'd like to know uh, not only how, uh, who's, who's in default, but also um, how, f uh, how late they are in reporting, uh, and when do we anticipate to get uh, their report? Oh, let me uh, recognize <laughs> Council Member Yeager. Apologize, no uh, and he has the question. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, several questions. I uh, I apologize if this was asked before. What is the annual number of reports that you're required to receive by all the wonderful laws that this body and our predecessors have enacted for you? Is there an annual number of reports that are required to be made that you know of? I think it's upwards of 400. 400 a year. Okay. Do you know uh, what it costs you to run this reporting uh, uh, maintenance system or reporting uh, uh, data portal or whatever it is that we're calling it that uh, in order to, to receive all the wonderful bills that the council passes requiring all the agencies to make very important reports to you? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a breakdown for the cost of the particular platform. Um, we developed it using open so source software, op open source code, so there was no investment in that technology. Um, and we have a small development team that's built out the portal. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning, which you didn't know, so we're moving from a brick and mortar library read, archive to, to one that's online. So the cost of making all of the archival records of the city and the library library materials of the city are joined together. Okay. I share uh, my colleague Councilmember Powers' concern about uh, whether this body spends an awful amount of time uh, legislating the reporting of information. Uh, I can't tell you how many votes in just three months I think I've already voted on that. Um, but what I'd love to know, and if you can, uh, I know that you're going to get some additional information for the committee when you go back, I'd love to know uh, what kind of savings uh, we'd have if, you know, instead of giving you 400 a year, you were only getting 200 a year, um, you know, or 100 a year, or 12 a year. Um, I'm curious to know how much we can save the taxpayers if we perhaps were to stop uh, legislating the various agencies of the city to prepare information that is probably readily available by simply asking the agency to give the information or not. Well, we, we can certainly look at that. I would just note that probably the higher cost is at the other agency level and not the Doris level, but we can explore that and come back to you. Right. What I frequently notice, uh, and this is not a question, this is really just commentary, what I frequently notice is that when we do a bill uh, to require an agency to report, uh, our, our, our estimate of the cost is zero. Um, we do that all the time. We say it doesn't cost anybody anything to do this, and it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it surely costs somebody to sit at a computer and type information or to make a copy of something. I mean, there's some cost somewhere. Um, but we're, we're very, this is the one place that this council is extraordinarily conservative, is uh, estimating the cost that, uh, uh, of, of the laws that we pass. Um, so I'd love to know the answer to that information. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Any other questions, council members? No? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All righty, great. And next we will hear intro uh, number 748, sponsored by myself, in relations to certain taxi and limousine commission related hearing procedures of the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. This bill addresses the hearing process used by TLC and OAF when hearing taxis related violation. It applies to any type of taxi, be it yellow cab, green cab, black car, or livery vehicle 
The nature of taxi and taxi business is such that responding to a TLC summons is a serious matter, often requiring time away from driving and just as often with significant, significant consequences for the viability of a person's livelihood. It is incredibly important that we ensure this hearing procedure are as fair as possible. With that in mind, this bill sets forth a number of requirements for hearing on violations of TLC laws and regulation. The bill will first require that the TLC provide a presence at relevant hearings, either in person, though a, a, through a representative or through a remote, remote method. The bill will next provide all hearing officers with the discretion to reduce violation penalties if the proposed penalty will constitute injustice by considering a number of factors, including the impact on both the recipient of the violation and the community overall. The bill will also provide that duplicate notices of violation should be dismissed when a respondent can provide proof of the duplication. The bill will also promote timely hearings by providing for them to begin within three hours of their assigned time or to be dismissed or rescheduled. Finally, the bill will place the final appeal of a violation determination with oath rather than with the TLC. I believe these measures will make it for a fairer process for the hearing of taxi-related violation. I would like to call upon the administration to testify on this, uh, on this bill, and we'll be calling upon Commissioner uh, De Valle uh, from oath. I'm sorry, this, uh, we're just calling for Commissioner Del Valle. I understand, and I will sit here silently. I'm gonna understand, I understand I'll be testifying right after Commissioner Del Valle, but the issues are very intertwined. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna ask uh, the members uh, to uh, just address the questions at this moment uh, to Commissioner uh, Del Valle. Uh, Commissioner Del Valle, uh, let's throw you in. Commissioner. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the chair and the committee, uh, particularly for their support in the last couple of years in uh, helping us communicate to uh, uh, the communities the changes that have occurred at Oath and how to deal with summonses in the city of New York. Uh, 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 adjudicatory process is, is pointless if nobody knows how it works, and I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, <coughs> I, ha I have a statement that I have been asked to, to read, which I have prepared, so I'll read the entire statement rather than just summarizing. Um, the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings is the city's independent administrative law court. In 1979, Mayor Koch established oath by executive order with the goal that there would eventually be one centralized city administrative law tribunal to adjudicate cases. In accordance with Mayor de Blasio's overall commitment to provide city residents and small businesses an administrative law process that is impartial and fair, oath has established a trials division and hearings division to ensure a more streamlined administrative tribunal. I'll add parenthetically here though that uh, we do not uh, here are PBB summonses, parking summonses, or traffic summonses. A lot of people confuse that. Oats Trials Division, administrative law judges serve five-year terms, one year longer than the mayor's term, and adjudicate the more complicated cases, including New York City civil servant disciplinary cases, law board cases, city contract disputes, city-issued licenses, discrimination cases under the city's human rights law, and cases involving the city's lobbying law. Oaths Hearings Division adjudicates summonses issued to residents and small businesses by agencies, some more than 24 agencies, including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Sanitation, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Buildings, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, and the New York City Police Department. Over the past 10 years, the Health Tribunal and Taxi and Limousine Tribunal and Environmental Control Board 
have been transferred into oath for cases involving summonses issued by the TLC. However, the TLC chairperson reserves the authority to adopt and reject <coughs> or modify final determinations of the hearings division as well as the trials division. Oath's mandate is to foster judicial professionalism, fairness, impartiality, equality, and the commitment to the integrity of administrative law decisions. As the city's administrative law tribunal, Oath is dedicated to providing due process in cases that originate with the city's numerous enforcement agencies in a fair and impartial forum that is also convenient and accessible to the public. Oath has been working for the past three years to consolidate adjudications and improve services to ensure greater transparency, equity, and fairness for city residents and small businesses. Intro 748, this bill seeks to amend the administrative code to grant discretion to Oath ALJs and hearing officers to reduce penalties established by the Tax and Limousine Commission in, quote, in the interest of justice, close quote, after considering factors set forth in the bill. It would put a difficult burden on the respondent to have to prove the existence of these factors. Variations in hearing results may convey the appearance of being arbitrary and capricious and therefore should also require the hearing officer to be provided with guidance as to the levels of reduction if he or she should find that a respondent's application for reduction has merit. Such guidance would come from either the TLC or this council. This bill also would make a determination of the appeals unit of the Oath Hearings Division a final administrative determination. In cases involving summonses issued by the TLC, thereby taking away authority from the TLC chair to adopt, reject, or modify these determinations. According to the Law Department, the proposal to move this power from TLC to oath apparently alters the present charter structure of powers of elected officials, especially in light of the very different appointment structures of TLC and oath. This issue may be exacerbated by the bill's provision authorizing oath hearing officers to reduce the penalties mm -hmm. in the interest of justice without further review by TLC. Concerning the provisions of the legislation that require a hearing officer to dismiss summonses <coughs> that would impose a duplicate penalty for violation already charged under another provision of law, oath already adheres to this practice where the respondent appraises the, when the, res when the respondent appraises the hearing officer of such duplicate charges. However, there remains some vagueness as to whether the duplicate, the duplicate summonses includes summonses returnable to another venue such as DMV. Oath is committed to ensuring that individuals appearing before tribunals are given a fair hearing, which includes the imposition of penalties authorized by law or by rule. Finally, the legislation appears to also limit the amount of time necessary for a hearing to begin. Oath is committed to providing greater access to justice by improving the efficiency and timeliness of the adjudications process without impairing due process. The chair and members of this committee are commended for their work to further that commitment. Oath has concerns about whether the time reduction as prescribed in the legislation, and I mean the process as described in the legislation, will result in enhancing Oath's commitment to efficiency and timeliness without impairing due process. Oath's concerns center around issues involving the cause for a delay and whether any such delay was reasonable. Moreover, Oath is currently undertaking a review of its procedural rules and is drafting amendments to improve efficiency and fairness of hearings. Nevertheless, as an administrative law tribunal exclusively having adjudicatory power, Oath has always remained consistent with its mandate to follow the law. Uh, with respect to that, I'd like to just add an addendum with respect to that uh, time limit uh, issue. The way the, the law is structured, somebody could have a summons scheduled for 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, walk in at 11.59, and then demand a dismissal because it was three hours after the time that was on the summons. Uh, that uh, I, I'm sure is not the intent of the legislation, but, but I think that's something that can be uh, um, remedied. Um, in short, 
Um, the administration is concerned that the legislation as written does not achieve the goals that I think are clearly intended by uh, the council. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. I have a couple of questions before I turn it over to uh, my colleagues. Um, Commissioner, if I, if I get, and I'm asking because I don't know, if I get a ticket by the NYPD, I'm driving, I get a ticket, and I go before a judge, is that word final when you go through all the appeal process? If you get a traffic ticket yes. as opposed to a TLC ticket? Yeah. Uh, no, I believe if you get a, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert on that process, but I believe if you go to the Traffic Adjudications Bureau, you can appeal to a central point somewhere in Albany. Right. I don't know what happens after that. But it goes before a judge, right? It's not like the, in, it's not like the police commissioner go over there. It, it doesn't go to the police department, no, it goes to DMV somewhere. Right, so wouldn't it follow the same logic? that when it comes to TLC, why, why, why when it comes to taxi livery, and for the sake of, from here for when I say taxi drivers, I mean all of them, uh, livery, black cars and so forth. So why, why a special provision will go to TLC and not have a judge who have no personal interest, his own bias, uh, and is supposed to hold the scales of justice in, with a blindfold. Um, that sounds very appealing, uh, but uh, I believe the city charter, the way it's structured, um, calls for the TLC, actually the commission, uh, to be the final uh, decision maker on, on violations. But going to your point, uh, other agencies have made oath uh, the final arbiter, particularly the Department of Consumer Affairs, but that was, uh, that was delegated by the Commission of Consumer Affairs to oath. Yeah, I feel uh, obviously uh, with the intention of this bill, more comfortable having someone who has no interest, who has, who's supposed to be uh, the weight the merits of both uh, presentations, whether it is the driver or TLC, and make that final determination. I will feel more comfortable. As a matter of fact, I believe the public will feel uh, more comfortable as well. I have a second question here, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues, and that is uh, getting back to this duplicate and substantially identical violation. Is that taking place right now? Well, let me be clear about, about something. Um, I know that TLC does not issue identical summonses for the, for, the, and the same, for the same violation at the same time at the same place. Right. Where it becomes an issue, as I understand it, is there's a TLC summons that is, that is issued. And by the way, TLC isn't the only entity that issues TLC summonses. Uh, Port Authority Police also issues TLC summonses. Okay. And at the same time, for this the same exact circumstances, uh, substantive facts and, and time and place, they will also issue a DMV summons. Mm -hmm. um, if the respondent makes us aware of that, the duplicate summons as required by law will be dismissed. If we have no other way of knowing about it unless the respondent makes us aware of it and of course provides proof. And I believe in fact that uh, uh, when a summons is issued by TLC and they're presented with that proof, they withdraw that their summons as well. Is, uh, is there a case where if I'm a taxi driver and I get a ticket by TLC that I'm gonna get one from NYPD? It happens. Uh, uh, I have, and this is anecdotal, I have seen uh, more particularly, for example, uh, taxi drivers who may be stopped at uh, the Port Authority bus terminal, they may get a summons from a Port Authority police officer on a TLC form. And if that 
Port Authority police officer feels like it, he will issue the same taxi driver the exact same violation on a DMV form. And that, that, that's, what, that's the type of problem that we're looking well, to address. From a purely judicial point of view, uh, is that like a form of double jeopardy? I mean, I'm getting hit twice uh, for the same traffic uh, ticket. Literally, that would be double jeopardy. Legally, it's not. Mm -hmm. And the reason that legally it's not is that under our Constitution, double jeopardy only applies to criminal charges. And these are not criminal charges. Right. Uh, theoretically, you could uh, dismiss a summons for exactly the same thing, and, and it gets it repeated and repeated and repeated. Of course, that doesn't happen that way, but legally it could. But it, I would say, and I'm just going to make a statement, not a question, is, is uh, it's excessive. If I commit a crime, if I'm, for example, driving as a regular member of the public, I'm driving my, my Honda, I get a ticket uh, for you know, speeding, I'm not going to get another ticket for the same you know, violation. Uh, I would s it would seem to me that just in the spirit of the double jeopardy, I know it's only in criminal law, but just the spirit of justice will call for that, you know, you pay for exactly for what you did, not more, not less. And that, to me, will truly uh, be justice. I'm going to open it I think it we up. would all agree with that. Yes. Everybody would agree with that. I'm sure the administration would agree with that. Okay. Let me recognize we've been joined by Council Member Kalos. Uh, and we'll start with Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Powers and Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Chairman Cabrera. Uh, you know, first of all, thank you, Commissioner, both of you, but especially Commissioner Soshi for, you know, being a leading agency that sometimes is a challenge for all of us because I know her heart is on the drivers. However, in the last few years, we've been on the attack uh, in our city. You remember, like, when we tried to pass a package of bill and the Uber and Lyft, the same day when we were supposed to be boarding in that package of bill, they had morning meeting in the morning. The same day, meeting with some elected to build support from those elected to be with Uber and not to support the package of legislation that we were intended to vote on that particular day. And I know that we wanted to move. We wanted to pass a number of legislation that we level the playing field in a city where it's full of opportunity for everyone, where the Uber and the Leaf and the other 70-something are company, they should be able to do fine without bringing out of business. You know, our yellow taxi industry, the liver and the traditional black company. So I know that you heart is being a leader in a difficult moment uh, uh, because you only you took for those companies and only to build those support and confuse to come up with a solution and a confusion, but also to invest millions of dollars attacking elected officials, those of us that wanted to level the playing field and to bring to their side all the elected officials. So in the last few years, we've been trying to work with a number of bills to protect everyone. First of all, we have professional taxi drivers. As a former one, 120 in Bailey and Cars and Cali Car Service that work during my nighttime as I went to City College during the daytime. I know that since the 80 and the 90 today, most of the taxi drivers, they are great, hardworking people. And this business is the opportunity that allowed them and us to take our family, to live as a working family in dignity, and to take our family to be middle class. But no doubt that there's things that we have been able to change, but many other things that still we had to change. You know, in the past, it was the same TLC person who gave the ticket and was a judge who played the role. Some changes being done. 
in the last, you know, we were able, and it was not my time, it was under the previous council member, that they were able to work with the, co the TLC commissioner, to work with City Hall, and be able to make some reform. But still today, I see both agency, we need to work closer, because I heard, and I fir I'm first for the, for the consumers, <laughs> and I know that the drivers are for the consumers and the riders. Someone get in the back of the car, made a complaint related to harassment, and that's not a process, and I, I'm not saying that it's not a process, but as it is right now, like that driver immediately, immediately is seen as guilty. So it's not that, if X person is in the back, a passenger in the back of the car, and he or she feel that she was, he or she was harassed, that person is called to go to TLC and present and bring lawyer and whoever, but drivers should not be found guilty or to give even the option on pay this amount or if no, you can come here. And when drivers are invited to go and face judge or the agency, the passenger are not called to face and make the case. So for me, like one of the, that's one of those areas that I hope that working together, we can be able to change it. You know, yes, anyone should be able to make the call or make the complaint. That person should be invited to come and meet the same day with the drivers and the driver to be able to defend. And if the driver is guilty, he or she should pay for the consequences. But I think I would like to see more clarity. So I would like to hear, you know, how do you see that process going on in those particular cases? When passengers made the complaint, what is the procedure that we have today? Are those individuals expected, those who made the complaint, that they had to come through the system and be able to present the accusation so that the drivers is able to be able to make his case, his or her case. I wish my answer could be as long. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, when someone, uh, a passenger, makes a consumer complaint, we classify these as consumer complaints. Uh, the complaint goes to TLC. TLC evaluates the complaint and if uh, they see that uh, it's appropriate, they will issue a summons to the driver for a hearing. At the hearing, a driver cannot be found guilty without the testimony of the complainant. Sorry, but uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry, sorry. Let me explain. Sorry, excuse me. Give me one second. Sure. But at the hearing, the complainer are not asking to face the driver, right? The testimony of the complainant can be by telephone or uh, eventually by teleconference. The reason that evolved and that's, that process has evolved for, to my knowledge, to my personal knowledge, for over 30 years is because many of the complainants claim, and this depends a lot on what the allegation is, uh, that they're afraid to be in the presence of the driver, in the physical presence of the driver. Um, so an accommodation, I think, that was created must have been <coughs> well over 25, 30 years ago. It allows the complainant to testify by telephone. But in any of it, and the complainant has to be able to answer questions that are directed to the complainant either by the driver or the driver's lawyer or the driver's representative. And on that basis, uh, uh, the uh, hearing proceeds to, uh, to its conclusion. That's the state of affairs right now. But uh, they can't just not show up at all. Uh, uh, complainants generally are given two opportunities to, to uh, appear either in person or by some other means. If they don't appear, then the summons is dismissed. Okay, I just like to see more clarity on that piece, I think that this process, it is, it is unfair to the drivers. Uh, again, I believe that any passenger, any riders, should be allowed, and we at the council take it very seriously for people to make a complaint. But they have to be a better dual process, 
if that person made a complaint, the complaint that person should be, if it by phone, then the driver should be able to have a conference call at the same time with whoever made the complaint. But I mean, again, I know that you also take your job very seriously. This is something that we, from the council, also should be able to provide more clarity. But the process as it is right now, it is unfair to the drivers, and I hope that we can change it. My last question, my second one, and first of all, before my question is, you know, we need to do something with those police officers that are in the George Washington Bridge, that they are under the Port Authority. Port Authority. Those agreements between NYPD and Port Authority also should have to be changed because I understand that, you know, I represent Northern Manhattan, and there is a one of those police officers there. It looked that they are still behind where we as a city are, you know, those productivity, a plan that police officers have to give, give a number of tickets a, a, a day, you know, it's still happening today in our city, but we have made changes and progress. It looked to me that those police officers in the other side, in the Port Authority, they follow the same quote or ticket that they have to give every day. Because, and again, this is not about someone as a Latino that always fights against racism and discrimination. This is not about a white police officer who is doing that. This is a Latino police officer who is in his car, and I get the law. The law is as I will assume. Someone who works for the authority, protecting the bridge, whoever come in or out, he or she should be able, as a police officer, to stand at 178 for Washington, Broadway for Washington, and be able to follow anyone that they see suspicion. That's not the case. And I will assume that's how they do it in George Washington, they do it in other places. They go to 175th, and they just go particular after taxi drivers. And the ticket that they give are no ticket that yet because that person is breaking the law starting at the, at the George Washington Bridge. It's about giving tickets, and those tickets are connected. Are those, whatever agreement or the way how it works, those go to TLC. And I think, again, I hope that we can make changes in not only around the George Washington, but in any area where we have the Port Authority police officer giving ticket, they should be follow individual starting with the location, but it cannot be that police officer from 178, which is his jurisdiction, he go to 168 to start giving ticket there or to 185th without anyone being connected or close to the George Washington Bridge. So I saw that you can look at that situation. I've been working and I have brought that, that problem to the local police officer. I have brought it to, you know, to our commissioner too in the past. This is something that, again, we hope that we address it because that's another way on how taxi drivers are treated as criminal, not as hardworking individuals that make important contributions to our city. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member uh, Rodriguez. And the very issue that you brought up of whenever a taxi driver has to appear before court and then you have the complainer over the phone, this very bill will address that issue. So uh, we appreciate your support in it. And uh, Council Member, we follow up with Council Member Powers and then uh, Council Member Yeager. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony. Uh, th there was one part of the bill that I didn't see in your testimony I wanted to ask a question about and I did read the TLC commissioners as well I think she mentioned it but didn't um, address an opinion on it so I want, and I, I'm not sure I know enough to to make a determination so I want to ask some questions on it, which is about the TLC as a petitioner to appear at the violation hearings um, in person or through a representative and um, not being able to pr uh, to proceed with the hearing uh, without that, without a TLC representative appearing. Um, I didn't notice any mention of that in your testimony. Is that something you agree with or disagree with? Right now, the structure of, uh, of uh, any summons hearing is that, um, let me preface it by explaining uh, yes, uh, uh, more broadly. Uh, agencies that issue summonses, whether it's a TLC, the police department, buildings department or whatever, fire department, have the discretion of whether or not they are going to send a representative 
to the hearing where the, uh, when the summons is adjudicated. At one extreme, you have, for example, the sanitation department, which issues the great bulk of the summonses that we deal with. They never send anybody, ex unless it's an extraordinary you know, dumping case or something like that. And at the opposite, you have agencies such as the TLC or Consumer Affairs or the Buildings Department or the Fire Department, which always has a representative and or the actual inspector who wrote the summons present at the hearing. Uh, that said, TLC uh, summonses require that there be a representative from the TLC at the hearing. At, at the moment, uh, the way the process works is there is a prosecutorial attorney who is, goes into the hearing as well as the respondent and or the respondent's attorney or, or representative if they choose to have one, which they have a right to. Uh, if during the process of the hearing the issue comes up as to whether or not the person who issued the summons should be there, uh, the hearing officer makes a determination as to whether that the presence of the, the, the summons writer uh, will add to the, to, the, to the body of knowledge necessary to adjudicate the summons or not. And if that's the case, this, the, the hearing is adjourned to call in the, the inspector or, or whomever wrote the summons. Um, and this applies to whether it's TLC or the buildings department or anybody else. If at the adjourned date the, the inspector does not appear, we will proceed with the hearing taking a negative inference from the fact that the, the, the writer of the summons didn't appear, negative inference being that they have nothing to testify to in support of the summons other than what's on the face of the summons. Uh, an, an exception to that is uh, the police department when they issue a TLC summons always appears either if it's the Port Authority Police by teleconference or NYPD uh, in person. But uh, that's the mechanics of, 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 of uh, uh, the respondent and the, and the summons writer being uh, present at the hearing. So today if a TLC ticket gets written, person who writes it doesn't show up to the hearing to, to discuss or and why the summons is written, it just you may have said, but it, what happens then, they get the adjourned to the next time? Remember, at the hearing, there is a there is a representative from the TLC at all times. Required and or because uh, sanitation doesn't send one, so the TLC always does. It's just TLC always. By does. practice, that's the standard practice. Yeah, um, and they are well you well versed on the particular summons. They have a file. Right. They know what the file says, the circumstances, and whatever. And that's usually more than enough to put forth the the, the facts and circumstances. If the respondent insists on the person who wrote the summons being present, then the hearing officer makes a determination if that will add anything to right, right, right. the proceeding. If he or she makes that determination, there is an adjournment for that uh, person to have the opportunity to appear at the adjourned date. And then at the adjourned date, the, the process continues. And if the TLC did not send a representative, and I applaud them for doing that, if they did not send one, same thing as sanitation or other, you could continue with the hearing absent there being there? I'm uh, trying to figure out whether if the, about the need for the requirement around well, whether. Well, that never, I don't think that ever happens. <laughs> uh, they always send somebody. Uh, TLC, uh, uh, actually TLC's offices, uh, the prosecutorial offices are in the same building as, as our adjudications unit. Yep. So it's, it's simply a matter of like walking across the hallway. Okay, yes, I think it is actually is across the hallway, <laughs> isn't it? Um, uh, okay, well, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it at that because I know others have questions and uh, thanks, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chief, and thank you, Madam Commissioner, uh, for being so patient. Um, uh, Chief Judge, right now, if a uh, respondent does not appear at the scheduled time or shortly thereafter on the same day, what happens with his case, with his summons case? Uh, assuming he has not called for uh, a, a reschedule or something like that, he defaults. Okay. 
and then a, a, a judgment is issued against him. Uh, Within five days, it, yeah. Guilty by default. Yeah. So what we do a review, we do a review of the summons uh, afterwards, which that's why we give ourselves a five-day window to make sure that at least on the four corners of the summons, uh, service was proper. If it wasn't proper, uh, even if the person didn't appear, the summons was dismissed. Okay. Um, that happens less than two percent of the time. And you've testified to this actually uh, previously uh, to the council uh, when you, we were talking about. Uh, the budget hearings, uh, you've indicated uh, how the dismissal rates are, are come about and sometimes there's service issues that require the court to, the uh, oath to dismiss uh, sua sponte on its own uh, without regard to a motion having been filed by the respondent to do so. Um, uh, the, the legislation, as I've read it, uh, the proposed legislation, would require TLC to uh, be present uh, in a very uh, various different uh, methods of being present, whether uh, in person um, by sending an authorized representative to TLC and to to oath, uh, to oath excuse right. me, or another authorized representative, as oath would permit by rules. So therefore, oath would actually be able to uh, create a rule that would allow somebody else, not an attorney admitted to practice uh, in this state, to represent the TLC at oath. And the third way is uh, if the tribunal offers the opportunity, you've indicated that the tribunal does, uh, by remote methods. Um, and you've created this window, we've created this window by this proposed legislation that would uh, require the case to be made or the case to proceed within three hours, a three hour window, otherwise there would be a dismissal. The dismissal in, and this is the question part, the dismissal in effect is a default judgment. Is that in correct? In reverse, yeah. In reverse, against the petitioner for not showing up. Correct. For essentially in the view of some of the sponsors of this bill perhaps and others for having wasted the court's time and wasted the respondent's time and wasted the witness's time. Um, if there's a witness, just they didn't show up. They had a time, they had a place, they had a very different methods of being able to do so and they've chosen for whatever reason not to. And of course, they surely could have contacted the court and said, uh, uh, judge, you know, or oath folks, we can't make it today for various reasons and oath would accommodate as oath would accommodate anybody who uh, receives a summons. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, the second question I have is, uh, you testified, uh, Chief, that, to the, that the witness, if, there's, if this is a summons written uh, by reason of a complaint filed, that the witness can testify by telecommunication methods, telephone, et cetera. That's not changing in this bill in your estimation, is it? No. Okay, well, that's, that's the right answer. It's not. <laughs> um, and I want to make sure about that because there are folks who are watching this at home and. Uh, who interacted with me over Twitter this morning uh, indicating that they have a concern that witnesses are now going to be forced to come down to oath and uh, have to sit there, two, two variations of the concern. One is that they have to sit there for three hours. One is that if they don't get there within three hours, their case will be dismissed. But the answer is they'll have a time given to them by which they can call a certain number or oath can call them, actually oath calls them um, and asks them to testify over the phone. And the council is not proposing legislation to change that in any way. Council is not looking to make it more inconvenient for witnesses, uh, complaining witnesses, to make their case and assist the TLC in prosecuting a summons. Uh, that's correct. In fact, theoretically, the, the respondent could be uh, on, the on, on one phone and the, the complainant on, a, on, a, on another phone. Now the, the, uh, uh, just as a, a technical point, when a, a inspector or police officer or whatever writes a summons, they are the complainant. When somebody who is uh, a, a consumer makes a complaint via uh, the, the, the TLC or, or whatever, the TLC is not the complainant. The, the person who made the complaint is a complainant, right. and you can't find somebody guilty of anything without the complainant who made the complaint testifying as to what happened. I have a clarification issue. In a case as you described it, um, uh, the second based on a complaint from, uh, from a rider, from a passenger, mm -hmm. from, a, from a New Yorker. Uh, who is the petitioner in that case? Um, the petitioner, th that, that, that's, a, that's a good question because the, the, the summons is issued by TLC. Okay, so it's TLC versus driver X. Yes. Correct? The, the council, uh, in its wise drafting, uh, has identified, has, uh, has defined the term petitioner as follows. The term petitioner means the city agency authorized to issue notices of violation returnable to the tribunal. 
Um, we have further in our bill uh, indicated that uh, a, a sequence of, of possibilities for how the petitioner appears before, uh, before the court. Uh, in your estimation, having read the bill, Chief, and I, I don't want to pin you down if you, if you need to look at it or and get back to us, but I think that this bill was drafted never to intend uh, that a witness, a citizen witness, uh, complainant as it were, have to appear physically before oath to make the case. Physically in person. That is correct. I don't know what okay. the intention was. All right, it's the, the intention's not, but the wording doesn't, the wording doesn't uh, appear there that would make you, as a wise attorney, uh, identify uh, a reason that you would have to dismiss a case because the complainant didn't show up. If in person. In, physically in person? Physically in person. That's correct. Okay, and, and Judge, in, in your uh, procedures at your court, you're still going to proceed, assuming this passes and the mayor signs it, uh, uh, you will still proceed accordingly and have uh, uh, the availability of witnesses to testify via telephone. Yes, in fact, we are in the process of uh, making technology more and more available for people to testify. In fact, eventually, I wouldn't be surprised if people would be testifying by way of their smartphone. The judge going to think it, and the judge is going to hear it. But we're in favor of technology. We're going to try to save you rent by <laughs> making everything over the telephone, and then everybody can stay home. Um, and just a, I won't have to wear a suit. <laughs> I have to wear a suit every day. Um, just a few more questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your indulgence. Um, the uh, I, I don't want to pit agency against agency. Uh, my record here is I would never want to do that, of course. And uh, Madam Commissioner has not had an opportunity to testify yet. But um, uh, the commissioner has, has indicated, and I'm not, it's not to you know you'll have a chance and, and we'll and we'll interact. Um, but the commissioner's testimony is. Uh, no, not that one. Commissioners testified that, uh, or in, I presume will testify, that uh, intro 748 specifies who may represent TLC in administrative proceedings, limiting such representation to attorneys admitted to practice law. This would be in contravention to practice in administrative hearings throughout the city. Uh, we know that would be the case if that were true. Um, but this bill, uh, as I've indicated, is very clear that the council is is uh, in section 19-902, uh, subsection A, subsection 2, that TLC can appear before your agency judge by sending an authorized representative who is an attorney admitted to practice law in New York State or another representative as oath permits by rule. Without getting into future seeing or seer seeing here, I would like to know, judge, would oath be open to, if it hasn't already, doing a rulemaking that would allow TLC to send anybody it wishes who isn't an attorney admitted to practice law if the agency so desired? I'm trying to be succinct. TLC can do that right now Anytime. because TLC in the past has had inspectors appear and, pro and essentially prosecute the case rather than attorneys. That is, that is uh, something that is strictly within the, the realm of TLC to decide whom they want uh, to do it. It's a matter of their managerial policy and structure and so forth, which has nothing to do with oath per se, so long as the person who appears is competent to appear. Uh, if it's an inspector, as was the case for uh, the majority of the existence of TLC, or uh, for efficiency purposes, uh, an attorney, uh, as is the practice today, it doesn't make a, a difference uh, as far as oath is concerned. Okay. Now, Chief, um, I've heard you testify before this council. I'm only here 100 and change days, so I'm not as knowledgeable as my very wise colleagues. Um, but one of the one of the things that I was most fascinated by when I heard you testify is is the notion that. Uh, under your administration uh, since the mayor came into office in 2014 and since you uh, became chief judge, that you desire to create this fairness at oath, this, uh, uh, this due process place where, where uh, recipients of summonses, respondents, whoever they are that may appear before the court, uh, not just have justice handed, but know that they were dealt with fairly even if they lose their case. I, uh, I'm as you know, I've said this before, I'm a recovering attorney. I've appeared before oath. I've lost cases. I've won cases. It's good to walk out of there knowing that even if you lost, 
you had your shot in court. Judge, is, is there anything in this legislation in your view that would diminish due process in any way that would make it worse for either the petitioner, the city of New York, or the respondents? I don't think there's anything in the legislation that will diminish due process per se. Um, there are questions, some of them of a technical uh, uh, matter that uh, as to who has authority to do what. And uh, I, have, I have a concern as to um, the ability of respondents to, to deal with uh, the criteria that have been set forth for uh, uh, reducing penalties. Apart from the fact that the, the, the hearing officer has no guidance on how to do that, so that that's, that's one issue. But we, p we have approximately 300,000 uh, hearings a year. And the people appearing at these hearings uh, vary from Michael Cohn, who uh, appeared on, on behalf of Trump Tower last year, to, um, uh, he did. Lost. He did. There you go. Uh, <laughs> to uh, 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 an individual who literally, uh, uh, sounds like a cliche, got off the boat and the process is totally alien to, to him. He comes from a, an environment where uh, due process basically is uh, uh, how much do you pay off the, 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 the cop or the judge or, or whatever. In fact, a, a friend of mine had a lawsuit in a country that I will not name in public. Uh, uh, when the, uh, the lawsuit was settled, or one, of, one of the items in the inventory of, from his lawyer was, quote, the usual gift to the judge. Um, and I'm not making this up. Um, my point being that uh, the expectations of what they can do and what they can't do, what, 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 it, what uh, is available to them, what their rights are, vary wildly. And very few of them uh, have the means or even know they can actually hire an attorney even though they're informed of it. And those who don't hire an attorney who have um, non-attorney representatives assist them, their skill level uh, varies wildly to, uh, from, from very, very skilled and, and, and expert in, in the subject matter to they actually do more damage to the respondent than, than, than help. And that's a conundrum. I mean, if we, we, if we require that every, every, every respondent have a, a licensed attorney, my concern is that nobody's gonna have anything. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a question I struggled with uh, 25, 30 years ago when I was the chair of the Tax and Winners Inc. Commission and the tribunal was at, at TLC and it's a, a question I struggle with right now. Chief, going to the, uh, the indicators of how a judge can, in the interests of justice, it's not actually the language, but, or what, but, but in whether or not imposing a penalty would constitute or result in injustice, and then there are several factors that the court may uh, utilize in order to come to that conclusion. Um, but at the core, it's a judge making a fact finding. Uh, and for the judge to make a fact finding, somebody has to present the facts to the judge. Correct. But this is not on whether or not there's guilt or innocence, which are based on the facts, or, gi or uh, 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 finding of whatever it's called. It's not guilt or innocence, I know. It's uh, sustained or not sustained, I believe, right? Okay. Um, if the, it, it, it's now in the penalty phase, and, and an applicant is, or, or a respondent is applying to the court saying, you know, reduce the penalty because, judge, Oath issues many, many uh, variations of pamphlets and guidances and various uh, languages designed to help educate respondents um, on, how to, on how to navigate your court. And you've essentially created a pro se court um, where people can go and get the justice. They, they don't desire to be there necessarily, but they go to the court because they have to. And you've created a system to make it easier on them. 
Um, it's the estimation, I think, of, of the people who uh, authored this bill and, and uh, other members of the council that, I, that we're willing to trust the oath judges, they're officers of the court, they're officers of the city, they took an oath. Uh, long before they were employed by the city, they took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the State of New York and the laws of, of New York State as officers of the court, they're state officers. Uh, we're trusting that when they n look at the factors, they'll be able to apply the facts of the case to the law as set forth in this statute. And if necessary, if appropriate, if justice requires, they will or perhaps or perhaps not uh, reduce the penalty. But it's, it's not mandatory that they do so. It's, it is the, the word may is all over here. May in the interest of justice reduce the penalty. It doesn't have to. It's not obligatory. Um, so the notion that somehow there's arbitrary and capriciousness involved in, um, in, in, in reducing or, or choosing to not reduce, it's set forth in the statute that it's uh, within the discretion of the, of, of the judicial hearing officer to do so. That's why I'm concerned specifically about the arbitrary and capriciousness aspect of it. Our hearing officers, uh, which number are a little over 300, are per diem hearing officers. Um, what, how one individual will judge something and another individual will judge something can vary widely. You can have a very compassionate individual and you can have Judge Roy Bean on, on, the, on the other side. Um, my concern is without parameters set forth in the law or in TLC regs, uh, the exact same th scenario could result in wildly different results. Or well, in oath rules. Why, well, why couldn't they be set forth in oath rules as part of a rulemaking that oath does, knowing that the statute has, has been enacted and oath does a rulemaking to set forth the parameters by which, and also judge, you know, you, you, you get this in every courthouse in the world, or at least in America. You get the hanging judges, you get the non-hanging judges, we <laughs> don't call them non-hanging judges, right? we call them liberals. But <laughs> you, you have that uh, in, in every courthouse. You have judges who view the facts, and, and judges are human beings, they're not computers. They look at the facts as they see them, and two judges looking at the same set of facts may come to two very different conclusions. That's normal, That's, there's nothing wrong with passing a statute that has that result as long as that result is not mandated, and that's what the council has done in this proposed legislation. It's put that forth as a may, as, as, a, as a possibility of, of the court availing itself of that option if necessary. Um, most of my practice since I left TLC and came back to government was in federal court. And in federal court, you have sentencing guidelines uh, that, uh, you know, the law, uh, the statute in the U.S. Code will say the uh, penalty for this violation is such and such, but the sentencing guidelines, which are not created by the court, uh, pretty much dictate how a judge makes that, that, that balance. And if a judge uh, goes outside of those parameters, he basically has to write an encyclopedia justifying it. What we're actually talking about is is, is fundamental to the concept of a fine. Uh, the only legitimate purpose to a fine, at least in, in our society, is to alter behavior that uh, society considers uh, inappropriate, whether it's a traffic ticket or whatever. And the fine itself, for it to be effective, has to have a level of sting to the p uh, person who has to pay the fine. That is, it doesn't have to destroy them. I mean, we're not talking about mass murderers here, but it has to be, uh, smart a little, hurt a little. The conundrum that we, we, we're looking at is, and it's, it's, it doesn't involve TLC really because they're pretty clear cut, but the conundrum is you would have, for example, uh, an example I like to give a lot, uh, the building where my office is is owned by SNL Green, which is the largest commercial real estate operator in the city of New York, and they're really, really good at it. But if, per se, one day uh, they fail to clean the sidewalk after a snowstorm within the magical three or four hours, whatever it is, after the snow stops, they'll get a summons for, I don't remember what the amount is, but 
parenthetically, that, uh, uh, hypothetically, that saves three hundred dollars. So a multi-billion dollar corporation, a three hundred dollar summons doesn't mean anything any more than than you dropping a penny on on the street. But you have uh, an elderly homeowner in in the Bronx who is in their eighties, is a widow and is living off Social Security, for that homeowner, a $300 summons could mean they don't have money for food for the next month because they're living off Social Security. And it's that kind of proportionality that is very, very difficult to balance. It's very difficult for an adjudicator to balance. It's very difficult, even more difficult, I think, for a, a, a legislative body to balance. But uh, that's a matter of justice, and uh, I'm sure you guys can figure it out. That's what we're working on, <laughs> Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Barron? Thank you, and thank you for coming. I'm looking at the briefing material that was given to uh, this committee, and one of the paragraphs says that in order to streamline the administration of cases and ensure that all defendants have access to counsel and a fair hearing, Oath has tried to implement alternatives to in-person hearings, and that's something we've been talking about. These alternatives include the opportunity, quote, to fight a summons online, by mail, by phone, and video conference and call. And then it says that uh, during your testimony on March the 19th, uh, you indicated that TLC chose not to participate in phone call hearings, but is testing webcam capacity for video hearings. So you've indicated that TLC always has someone there at the hearings? Yes. So then it hasn't had any impact on their not wanting to participate in a phone call hearing. And did they mean that the respondent did not want to? And the does that then have an impact on the hearing? Um, uh, I don't want to speak for TLC, but um, TLC always has a TLC representative right. at the hearing. The issue is whether or not the respondent right. can can uh, appear remotely uh, in one fashion or another. Uh, right now, uh, we technically, number one, by, by oath uh, rules and, and, and our technology, we can accommodate virtually any type of, of remote type hearing. I mean, we've even done it overseas. Um, but all the parties have to be agreeable to it. Uh, and uh, we're working with TLC to do remote video uh, 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 testimony of the respondent. Uh, TLC has concerns uh, regarding doing it by telephone. So have they refused to participate in a hearing where the respondent only wants to be there by phone, via phone? That's my understanding. So what has that meant in terms of the case being if the respondent doesn't appear, they default. The respondent has but if to you're appear saying that person. the law allows them to appear via phone, and if TLC, for whatever reason, is saying they will not participate, it seems to me that the respondent is the one that's being penalized unjustly if, in fact, they are offered the opportunity to do that and the uh, TLC is refusing to participate. When TLC uh, uh, declines to uh, participate in, in that program, the offer isn't, isn't transmitted to the respondent because it's not available, as, uh, as, is it is, as though it is not available. I don't think that's fair. That if you're saying that these are the mechanisms and the means by which respondents can participate, but TLC says we won't participate or allow the respondent to uh, have a hearing because they're not there in person. That to me, Mr. Chair, seems that that's something, and perhaps that's a bill that I'll introduce to say that TLC will not be able to have that option. I'll talk to you about that. Well, I'll second that. Thank you. Please make me a co-plan. Okay, I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just interject yes. that uh, um, before you do that, you should then find out TLC's rationale. I don't think their rationale gives them the um, justification to deny the respondent to participate in a form that everyone else has because TLC doesn't want to do it. We'll ask 
we'll have to have a hearing so they'll have an opportunity if they come well, to actually, share their opinion. Well, actually, the, uh, the commissioner's here, and she'll, uh, in the next two minutes, uh, she'll be testifying, and so you'll get to ask that question. Thank uh, you. Uh, loving, uh, looking forward to having uh, uh, you ask that question. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I just have one more question, and I, I want to thank uh, TLC Commissioner for being patient here, but do you believe that sometimes, do you believe it may sometimes be in the interest of justice to allow the hearing offers, officer to reduce a proposed penalty? Do I believe it's possible that in the interest of justice, a hearing officer should be able to reduce a penalty? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, Commissioner uh, I know, and Judge, I know you have a lot in your plate. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for being here today, and thank you for all the hard work uh, that uh, you have exemplified, model, and of. And, uh, and with that, you, you um, are free to go. Thank you so much. <laughs> and so uh, we, um, now we're gonna have a TLC commissioner, um, and we're gonna... Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Cabrera, and to the entire committee, and thank you for your interest in government operations, which put most people to sleep, so thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the Governmental Operations Committee. I am Mira Zoshi, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to share TLC's views on Intro 748. TLC licenses and regulates 130,000 vehicles and about 180,000 drivers who transport approximately 1 million passengers a day. The laws passed by Council and rules promulgated by TLC play a vital role in protecting these passengers, their drivers, and the general public. For example, TLC summonses are issued for violations of City Council laws, including important Vision, Vision Zero legislation, and for violations of TLC rules governing safe driving, prohibiting sexual harassment and service refusals, and ensuring that important consumer protection standards are met. Most of our drivers never end up at an oath hearing, but when they do, it's for something serious, and the failure to appropriately penalize them harms not only passengers, but also other New Yorkers who drive or walk across the city's streets every day. TLC develops its rules and penalties based on its experience regulating a complex industry, and they take effect only after undergoing the process mandated by the Citywide Administrative Procedures Act, including notice to the public of the rules, a public hearing, and then a public vote by the Commission. This process typically takes at least 90 days. Having our summonses heard before an oath hearing officer ensures that our licensees who are issued a TLC summons receive independent adjudication of their cases. Both TLC and oath recognize that a driver's time spent at oath is time spent not on the road and not earning money. Each day, TLC prosecutors are available and ready to appear at oath hearings to ensure that no driver has to wait for TLC to appear. Oath 2 has focused on making improvements in its hearing processes intended to reduce case backlogs and wait times. I'll now turn to intro 748, which would amend the administrative code by adding several new sections. It would require TLC to appear at hearings on TLC summonses by person by a representative who is either an attorney admitted to practice or another represented authorized by oath. In the event the petitioner fails to appear, oath would be prohibited from holding a hearing and oath would be required to dismiss the violation unless TLC makes a timely request to reschedule. Intro 748 would also give oath hearing officers the added task of considering reductions to penalties set forth in TLC rules and in local law. The proposed legislation would also require the hearings on violations of TLC regulations or local law beginning within three hours of the hearing time set in the summons. If that deadline is not met, oath would then have to reschedule or dismiss the violation. Intro 748 would also require the hearing officer to dismiss a duplicate notice of violation. 
Finally, intro 748 would establish that in any case in which a respondent is charged with violating a provision of law or rules enforced by the TLC, a determination by the appeals unit of the ill hearings division is final unless the respondent seeks review by TLC to further, the penal to further reduce the penalty. This provision conflicts with established authority and precedent that designates the TLC chair as the final arbiter of policy interpretation. I want to highlight some additional concerns into intro 748. TLC's regulatory system is established by charter. Section 2303 of the charter vests TLC with broad authority over the regulation and supervision of the business and industry of transportation of persons by licensed vehicles for hire in the city. To that end, the charter requires the TLC to set policy and make rules governing the industry, including bases, drivers, and vehicle owners, also subject to the notice and comment requirements of CAPA. Intro 748 is thus not, writ not written on a blank slate. The proposed legislation, however, ignores these regulatory and adjudicatory powers by giving oath hearing officers and not the TLC the ability to establish appropriate penalties for violations of rules and laws designed to protect millions of daily passengers, tens of thousands of drivers, and the general public. It's also important to remember that in many cases, the penalties for, TLC vi for violations of TLC rules are set by local law. And in intro 748, this would put the onus on oath hearing officers to second guess the penalties set by this council, not just those set by the TLC. Hearing officers are charged only with finding facts and applying the law, not making independent policy determinations. And while we understand the intention may have been to minimize the impact on some communities perceived to have received disproportionate summonses, this bill instead sends a message to the public that grave infractions need not be taken seriously. Additionally and practically, the many factors that hearing officers would be required to review in considering a penalty reduction will unquestionably add a significant amount of time to administrative justice process because the bill will, in effect, create a two-part proceeding, one in which the respondent's guilt or innocence is determined, and in the case of a finding of guilt, a penalty phase as the hearing officer examines each and every factor specified in the bill and presumably takes evidence on many of them. In sum, intro 748 would dangerously compromise TLC's policy-making authority to determine the violations that pose a threat to public safety and our ability to specify the appropriate level of punishment for violations of TLC regulations by substituting TLC's policy-making and enforcement determinations with the decisions of an individual oath hearing officer who are finders of fact, not legislators or regulators. By diminishing TLC's authority in this area, the bill would remove critical safety and consumer protections for passengers and for the general public. Intro 748 also specifies who may represent TLC in administrative proceedings, limiting such representation to attorneys admitted to practice. This would be in contravention to the practice in administrative hearings throughout the city by, uh, of allowing appearances by both recent law school graduates awaiting admission to the bar and law students, all of whom operate under the supervision of experienced agency attorneys. It also threatens the current practice of allowing law enforcement officers from the police department and Port Authority and others to appear in prosecutions of summonses that they write for violation of TLC laws and rules. We're unaware of any other agency whose ability to represent itself in an administrative proceeding to adjudicate violation of its rules and regulations is limited in this way. And we're not aware of any stated public purpose for this limitation to apply only to the TLC. The bill would further impact the exercise of administrative justice by providing for TLC summonses, including those issued for violations of local laws enacted by the council to be dismissed if a hearing is not held within three hours. We're not aware that Oath has experienced difficulties in scheduling hearings in a timely manner. In fact, currently, even drivers who show up as much as six hours late for a hearing are given an opportunity by Oath to be heard rather than face a default judgment against them. Based on consultation with the Law Department, we also note that Intro 748 
raises significant legal conflicts. Among them is one raised by the provision of the bill that with one narrow exception, make rulings of the appeals unit of the Oath Hearings Division, which exercises powers of the, formal TLC, the former TLC tribunal, the final determination of the tribunal in any case where a respondent is charged with violating a provision of law or rules enforced by the TLC. This appears to misconstrue the function of the charter mandated chair review, which is significantly limited to review only of interpretations of TLC rules and applicable laws. The TLC is an operational and regulatory agency charged with regulating the for hire transportation industry, while OATH is an adjudicatory agency charged with resolving disputes. The power to make final determinations in matters other than findings of fact was assigned to agencies by voter referenda enacting and amending the City Administrative Procedure Act, CAPA, in 1988 and again in 2010. Moving this important power from TLC to oath would be a fundamental structural alteration raising serious questions concerning its consistency with the balance of power within city government set forth in the Charter. In conclusion, TLC is concerned that intro 748 will not only shorten, will not shorten or simplify the oath process for drivers, but instead will extend the time because of the long list of determinations hearing officers would be required to make, time when drivers could be out making money or with their families. And perhaps most important, it will not protect New Yorkers against the rare but all too real occurrences when they are victimized by dangerous driving, outright denials of service, sexual and other forms of harassment from a TLC licensee, or from a driver or business operating unlawfully without a license. Thank you for allowing me to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. I'm gonna I'll start with Council Member Barron because she left out with a question with yes. Commissioner <laughs> Del Valle, so I would love for you to have an opportunity to answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the Commissioner for coming. And again, just to re reiterate, the briefing materials that the committee received in preparation for this hearing says that in order to streamline the administration of cases and ensure that all defendants have access to counsel and a fair hearing, Oath has tried to implement alternatives to in-person hearings. These alternatives include the opportunity to fight a summons online by mail, by phone, and by video conference. And the uh, testimony here, the facts here in this briefing say that uh, the administ Chief Administrative Law Judge, uh, Del Val, shared that TLC chose not to participate in phone call hearings, but is testing webcam capacity. So my question to you is, is this accurate? And what is the reason that TLC does not participate in phone calls? So as I read the briefings as I walked in, that uh, same section caught my eye because we've been doing a lot of work at the TLC to ensure that drivers are out on the street earning money and they're not tied up in our processes any more than they absolutely need to. So we try to do everything online and by phone. So that provision caught my eye as well. Um, and I know we've been actively working on video conferencing, so I wanted to understand why we weren't actively working on the phone conferencing as well. It turns out we have no objection to doing phone conferencing. We need to understand the appropriate method for the respondents to be able to submit evidence via the phone calls. So that, to me, is an ongoing process. It doesn't seem like with all of the technology and means of communication that don't require in-person appearance available to, uh, to us today, that that needs to stay unresolved. Have you participated in phone call hearings? No, we have not because we haven't yet Do you object out. to participating? Absolutely in not phone because the- So the then why haven't you participated Because we're working out with hearings. OATH the appropriate means for the respondents to present their evidence over the telephone. Oftentimes it's documentary evidence, um, and things of that nature. So it's how do we make sure that that can get into evidence for the oath hearing officer to appropriately evaluate it um, because they should have that opportunity to fairly present all of their evidence. But we absolutely have no objection to the goal of making sure that people have easy access to the adjudications forum. So have you asked the hearing judge, the uh, trial judge to 
get this information prior to the date so that you could be able to participate in a phone? I, I don't know the exact nature of the negotiations, but I am happy to follow up with you on our particular concerns and how we're working with those to address them. And do you think that it is discriminatory and does a disadvantage to the respondent for you not to be able to participate in a phone hearing? I think I am a, a, a strong advocate for allowing people to participate in any means that is causes the least inconvenience for them, especially when we regulate the way that they make a l their livelihood. So I absolutely am a proponent for saving them time away from their job. Um, so we w are wholeheartedly moving forward and working, especially on the video conferencing, which is the ideal situation, even for drivers, they get to actually look at the, especially in consumer complaints, the complainant on the other side. Um, it is the ideal situation, and in lieu of that, while there is phone conferencing available, as soon as we can figure out how to do the exchange of evidence, we are absolutely supportive of that. But I do agree with you, it should be offered to both sides in a way that both sides can take advantage of a more efficient way of appearing. So before you're coming into this hearing today, were you aware that that was an issue? Because I thought I heard you say that when you came in, you saw it and it caught your I attention. I was unaware it was an issue. We've been advocating for the video conferencing. So who um, makes the decision as to whether or not you will be able to participate in an on-phone, a phone hearing? We That's make it together you, as, as an agency. We, we have several issues and several divisions, um, but is an active, ongoing discussion with OATH about how to make that possible. And how long have you been trying to make this possible? I'm gonna, um, to defer to my assistant commissioner, uh, Mohammed Akanulu, who's right here, who's head of our prosecution, who can advise us on the exact status of that. Thank you. I do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, there has never been any. Can you give us your name, please? Your name? My name is Mohamed Akinlulu, Assistant Commissioner for Prosecution at TLC. So there has never been any phone call hearing at OAF regarding any TLC cases. Never. Right. So, there, so was a dis okay. there was a discussion as to whether respondents could testify over the phone, and we just raised our concerns that how do we know that it's actually the, uh, it, we have the actual respondents on the phone, that's one then if they have to comply with TLC rules, they have to show compliance. So how do they present compliance over the phone? And if they have to present defenses also, like if a critical driver summons is issued and someone has six, seven points and he has taken a class, how do we get that certificate over the phone so that we can withdraw the case? So how long have you been trying to address this issue and get a resolution for that? No, it, it wasn't an ongoing uh, 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 di discussion. I, I, I think it was like about two years ago that it happened, and that was the end of it. So then we now move to webcam, so because we do video conferencing right now. you know. So uh, I'm not clear. How far away are you? Let me start at the other end then. How far away are you from resolving the issue of participating in phone hearings. It, that's what I say. It wasn't an ongoing discussion. So we discussed it then, and that was it. So, so far, now we have moved. TLC and OATH have moved away from phone uh, 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 testing, uh, 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 hearings, hearings yeah. to webcam. So we're working with SBS now to implement webcam. So we have the resources now, and OATH has it. So, but right now, there have been instances where few respondents, you know, from Staten Island, they appear via video conferencing, and we are always there, you know. So OAT has you know, the uh, capacity, you know, to, to do that, and we go to the courtroom. There are some courts, you know, at home, some courtrooms where we do that. So we do a video, video conferencing, you know, for respondents and so for airport dispatchers. Okay. So... You have completed the testing by webcam capacity, and you are, in fact, using that for video hearings? We, it's we already in place? It's not finished? We, we use it for airport dispatchers from airport for airport cases. But for respondents, we haven't started doing that. So public. when do you think you'll be able to have it in place? That's basically my question. We have it in place. OAT has it in place. So it's now for OAT 
to we, okay we have we're working on our universal summons so on the summons which we intend to put into cons uh, uh, production in june so there is a paragraph on the summons that if you choose to appear by webcam you should contact oath so, you so by june it'll be in june, place. In june. Yeah. thank you so thank you mr chair thank you for your interest because i think it is the the absolutely the next phase of hearings that they'd be done during over video conference for the convenience of both the complainants the respondents and the tlc thank you before i i go to councilman yeager i i, I was a little confused here because uh, i hear you commissioner said that there's ongoing discussion and then i hear your assistant commissioner says that there is no discussion um here's the second piece that is huge from my understanding, uh, the other agencies, because you mentioned, Assistant Commissioner, that you don't know who's on the other side. Well, that would that statement would invalidate the 15,000 plus already phone court proceedings that had taken place, uh, and I have full trust on the courts in oath uh, so I don't understand on what basis are uh, you making that statement? I, th I think it's also a matter of the two agencies coordinating um, on what standards are necessary for the phone conferences. Um, and at this stage, does it make more sense to move, it, to get everybody on video conferencing now? And I think that is the better, the better step both for the drivers and for um, the, the complainants because there's certainly a difference in quality in terms of re replicating the atmosphere in a hearing room in a video conference than there is in the phone. Uh, 15,000 other phone calls have been made. So we that have, let me, let me finish, I'll let you finish, <laughs> uh, that have worked effectively and in the spirit of justice uh, was done correctly. Uh, so do you have any data, any research to substantiate that a phone call uh, proceed proceedings are less effective or would not meet the standards? Is there any research that you guys have? I think, um, and I think we'll I'll defer to um, Chief Devaye, as well as take it up in discussions afterwards, especially with their experience with phone calls and having respondents come in um, so we can better understand how the those cases, if there's any differences in the nature of the evidence that needs to be presented um, in the cases that you're referring to and our cases, but it's certainly a matter of coordination between our agencies and the willingness of both of our agencies. Um, an oath I defer to on having the experience of dealing with these uh, phone cases, which they do now, um, on how we can get to a, a level where we're all comfortable in engaging with them. I, I would hope that you will provide the same option that has been given in other agencies, and I admire the other agencies for doing it. And I appreciate, Commissioner, the statement that you mentioned earlier that you don't want, and I really do, you don't want to interfere uh, in their daily business of trying to, you know, some of these men are only making now, at the end of the day, only $100 a day. But next year, they'll be, it's, you'll make more money working at McDonald's. You might already make more money working at McDonald's. And, and I appreciate that. Uh, that. That we somehow, some way, we have to make it easier and more feasible and have accessibility to, to uh, uh, procedural justice. So I, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Councilman Yeager. He has a few questions, and then I'll come back and I have a few others. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Madam Commissioner, you were here uh, when the Chief Judge was testifying earlier, and I had some ridiculous questions. Uh, but I went through the statute and uh, indicated the manner in which uh, the <coughs> proposed statute would allow the uh, the petitioner, TLC, to be represented or to make an appearance at oath. And uh, I'm not going to enumerate them again. It's three or four different ways, one in person. The one that you focused on is um, the attorney part. And your uh, 
in two places you said that the bill would require TLC to appear at hearings on TLC summonses in person by a representative who is either an attorney admitted to practice or by another representative authorized by oath. And then uh, you <coughs> indicate on page four, um, intro 748 specifies who may represent TLC in administrative proceedings, limiting such representation to attorneys admitted to practice law. Right? That's or as or oath authorizes. That's not what it says, and that's not what you said. But I'm sorry, that's not what I said. I, th I believe that's what it says. My and that's why that's. That I, I want to be very clear. No, I'm glad you raised because I was listening to you as you asked the question, and I will check my own testimony. But it is a, or as oath authorizes. So there is this additional ability to expand beyond attorneys. <coughs> and but then you further go on that this would be in contravention of the practice of administrative hearings throughout the city by allowing appearances by both recent law school graduates, awaiting admission to the bar law students, etc. It also threatens the current practice of allowing law enforcement officers and the police department port authority to appear in prosecutions of summonses. That's just not true. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the indictment. You are unaware of any other agency whose ability to represent itself in administrative proceeding to adjudicate violations of its rules and regulations is limited in this way, and you are not aware of any stated public purpose for this limitation to apply only to TLC. So we're not a bunch of maniacs here. Um, well, maybe some of us, but nobody at this table. Uh, you know, the bill was written, and uh, learned counsel employed by the city council which we're going to hire a thousand more of them for like thirty <laughs> billion dollars. Apparently, we passed our own budget. I voted no against it, but uh, it's going to happen anyway. So a lot of people here worked on this bill and set forth this mechanism by which your agency can appear to prosecute these cases. And um, it's not. I mean, I want to make sure that we're all understanding here. TLC is not being handcuffed by the council in how you prosecute your cases. That's not the intent here. The intent is. And I'll get to a question, the, but the intent here is to is to streamline a process to make it cheaper for TLC to prosecute these cases, to make it cheaper for respondents to appear to defend themselves, and to make it cheaper for witnesses to participate, right? Because we're setting it up in, in a place that's already set up for hearings, in front of a, a group of people who are already set up and ready to do their hearings. We're, we're giving you the rules and regs for how these hearings should go, and we're also setting forth that, look, you know, we're both... If, if TLC can't move ahead in a three-hour window on the return date of a summons without having actually asked the court for an adjournment, which is typical, you know, in any other court anywhere in America, you know, if you can't show up, ask for an adjournment, uh, it's going to be dismissed. That's just normal. And I'm just trying to understand where the, where the objection was putting aside the part that's just not 100 percent accurate, but I don't understand the objection to having a court adjudicate cases, which is essentially what oath is. Um, so I do want to just address the first point. So on page two, on the second paragraph, th that's where I said the bill would require TLC to appear at hearings on TLC summons in person by a representative who's either an attorney admitted to practice or another representative authorized by oath. And you're right, I don't repeat that entire phrase on page four, but I do say it on page two. No, no, no I agree. Yeah. I, that's my point. So I agree that you say, Commissioner, I'm sorry, I agree that you say it in one place, but, I, but my point about the paragraph on page four is that the entirety of the paragraph goes through all of these heinous things that we're doing to you in this bill and then, you know, indicts us with that no other agency ever has ever had this kind of handcuff put on them. But really, it's not, we're not doing anything. So we're I not changing your rules. I think um, uh, Chief Devalier put this very succinctly. Today, um, we have a practice of um, complete freedom of who we choose to appear at hearings, and we uh, have our own policy of <coughs> making sure that we're always represented at hearings, though we're not required to, and there are other agencies where there is not an agency representative at the hearing. Um, so those are decisions that the TLC makes on who we want to appear at hearings and that we will always appear at hearings. Um, the change that would be made in this law is it would just take that decision making from TLC to oath. And so today, there's no reason why we think practice would change at all should this provision become law because um, Chief Devalle and I have a good working relationship and we have an understanding and we know how well it works currently with us having um, the, the you know, universe of people that we have coming in. Um, but I think the concern is, does that 
does that handcuff an agency in the future should you not have a good working relationship with the adjudicatory <laughs> body where they could limit you to just um, practicing attorneys which may have a, an administrative, um, create an administrative burden for the agency and also be a, a problem for licensees because it might slow up our process if the, a variety of people that we can have come in on our behalf is limited. So I think the concern is not the, the, the fact that there is um, options today and there is also today um, if the oath today continued to allow everything that TLC does on its own today, that there wouldn't be options tomorrow. It's what happens later on if those options could somehow be taken away. And that's really our concern. So I, I'd like to just, uh, uh, um, I know this is not a response uh, back and forth thing, but I'd like to just briefly explain that um, two things. First of all, you know, in my view, oath and TLC are both agencies of of one person. It's the mayor today and it's the mayor tomorrow and it's the mayor after that one and it's any mayor. And where there are disputes between agencies, they get worked out by the executive. Uh, the executive doesn't work for the council with the exception of laws that the council passes subject to enactment. Um, so, you know, if there's a, if there's a debate and, and one, mor one morning uh, some future chief judge who is not as wise as uh, Chief Judge Lavalle wakes up and says, no more anybody who isn't a lawyer, well, you know, I assume you'll figure out, and your successor will figure out how to work that out. But more importantly, and it's important to note this, I think um, at every court everywhere determines who gets to practice in front of it. It's not, it's not a strange thing. It's normal. It's regular. It happens. That's the way the system works. I can't walk into a court in New Jersey and start practicing law because the courts in New Jersey have not authorized me to do so, but I can go anywhere in New York State and do it. And that's the way it's supposed to work. Right? The court authorizes who may show up, subject to the enabling statutes that the legislature gives it. In this case, assuming this is enacted, the legislature will be giving a set of rules by which the court will authorize who may and may not appear before it. I can't imagine a scenario where the court is going to uh, refuse to produce a set of rules that enable the TLC, either this TLC and this oath, or a future TLC and a future oath, to uh, go about its business in an orderly fashion. Um, so, I, I mean, I just wanted to address the concern because uh, obviously I do believe your concerns are serious and I, I do know that you do speak with your counterparts at the uh, other agency, but uh, it's important, I think, from my perspective to just un for you to understand what the council's thinking and why it does this. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to address something that you indicated with respect to the TLC powers and authorities um, uh, and the, mis the misconstruction that this council appears to have uh, with of the charter mandated chair review, which I understand that uh, the TLC is an operational and regulatory agency, no dispute from me, charged with the regulation of uh, the industry, no dispute, uh, and oath is an adjudicatory agency charged with resolving disputes. Um, as an adjudicatory agency, just like a, any other court, it's also charged with not just making a finding of fact and a conclusion of law, but also the ultimate result, what is the judgment, what is the judgment of the court, what is the penalty to be imposed. Maybe no penalty, maybe a thousand dollars, maybe a hundred thousand dollars, maybe a revocation of a license, whatever it may be. And the council gives its set of rules, which you're, you're very concerned that uh, this, this law um, uh, contradicts some prior laws that the council has made. And clearly I, I can assure you that I've been assured that this council has attorneys who are very wise and uh, before they write a bill, they, they, because they don't let me write any bills, um, <laughs> they, uh, no, it's a true story. <laughs> they, we'll talk about it later. They don't, uh, they, they look at all across the statutes um, to make sure that what we're doing is not, is not preempted either by state law, uh, by federal law, and of course within the city of New York to make sure that we're not doing something that's contrary to our, our lawful rights under the charter, our obligations under the charter to make and write laws that, uh, that enforce the, parameters of the charter. So that's what we're doing, and I want you to be assured that uh, this council is not going to pass a law that, that you know, is, is nullifying its prior law without simply, you know, repealing the law, which it could do if it chose to. Um, uh, I'm not going to, to beat the dead horse of the telephones because I think you've indicated very well that your, your agency is most desirous of, of doing telephone hearings. My concern about telephones was not even for the petitioner respondent issue so much as that I wanted to make sure 
that the witnesses, the, 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 the New Yorkers who are affected by the industry that you're regulating are able to get their case before the judge and say, this is what we saw, and with no interference, and I wanted to make sure that, and the chief indicated that in his view, um, uh, th this law does nothing to hinder the ability of a New Yorker to put forth his or her complaint and to make sure that it's going to get a fair hearing and that to the extent necessary, if punishment need be meted out, it is. And uh, this statute, in my estimation, before adding my name to it and in the estimation of other members, I believe, but also in the estimation of the court, uh, is, uh, is perfectly in line with our desire, our policy desire, of making sure that New Yorkers are able to get unsafe drivers off the road, because that's your job, and I think you do it well, and I, we're not trying to keep you from doing that, and I want to make sure that you understand that, and a lot of the testimony, I, I, frankly, is, it gives the indication that we're a bunch of maniacs who are like trying to, I, I know you didn't say that, <laughs> and I don't mean that you said it. I have to be quiet. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's you, so you, hard. You do right after this, hang on. I'm almost done, and the, commission, the, the chairman's gonna cut me off anyway. I'm used to the, you know, we lawyers, we have the words and they just can't stop. Um, I thought you I, were a reformed lawyer. I am a reformed lawyer. It means I can't charge anybody for being a lawyer, but once a lawyer, always a lawyer, the judge will tell you. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's most important that, that you understand that what we're trying to do is we're trying to make that balance of the fairness. Not, it's not just about waking up in the morning because we want to protect drivers from your, your awful hands. It's not what we're doing. And it's not because we want to make sure that Oath has more work to do. It's not what we're doing. It's what we want to make sure that unsafe drivers are off the road in a way that, that protects the city, that protects the rights of everybody, the, the riders, the New Yorkers who are crossing the street and uh, from, from the errant cab driver who's not watching what he or she is doing, and the rights of the cab drivers to not have their licenses revoked because, you know, just cause. So take it away. I didn't really <laughs> ask a question, but you can say anything you want now. All right, so I think that you raised two points, and I'll try to be succinct because um, I know the time is 345, and I'm going to make one comment here because I had a meeting at the office at 4 p.m. with a family of uh, drivers. So do you want to tell them I'll be late at 4.15? Yeah, Commissioner, we almost okay. only have literally just one question. Okay. And it's really, it calls for a very short answer. All right, perfect. We only well, I will like be very succinct minutes. in my Thank answer, you. and then we will get Thank everything you, done this appreciate afternoon. That. And I appreciate um, your sensitivity to that. So the two points that I think we talk, you talked about, Councilman Yeager, are um, the sort of balance of, of the, you know, the adjudicator versus the regulatory agency. And I think previously you had raised the issue of should the penalties possibly be in, in oaths, rules for agency, if that would give them the proper guidance. Um, and I think that, and, and, and also, um, the, the point of who does the court get to decide who, uh, who is in attendance at hearings representing both parties. And I think a lot of those um, sort of key into the fact that this is administrative, it's, el it's an administrative um, hearing process and it's also um, in some ways this hybrid because there has been this delegation of many agencies to oath. The agencies retain a certain amount because um, it's a delegation. Um, also, by retaining um, a certain amount of authority over the process, things like the ability in state law that allows us to docket um, money judgments against unlicensed operators is in particular tied to the fact that we have retained and we have delegated some authority. And that's really muddies the waters a lot. Um, and I think you know, you've, you've aptly described how um, courts without those constrictions um, have um, certain bright lines between what they can order and what the, the prosecutor um, decides. And they're, they're com more complex, I think, in this issue, and we're happy to meet with you afterwards and sort of go over in more detail how those, um, that retention of power sometimes causes um, problems in sort of figuring out what the right rules are going forward. And even last year, the fire department, um, in, in recognition that the fire department is the enforcement agency and the authority over what the right penalty should be over violations of the fire code, 
worked with Oath to take their penalties out of Oath rules and put them in the fire department rules um, so that the it was clear that the agency was the one determining monetary penalties and Oath would be the one applying them. And again, I think that speaks to this um, this dynamic you have here in, in administrative law, especially with the agency delegation of power. Um, I was very glad that you raised the point on clarifying who is appearing by phone, um, because we had a lot of confusion as well. Um, I think there are many people here that are gonna testify, one, about the importance of being able to testify by phone as a consumer, and also about um, the, the, the sort of consequences they fear of uh, maybe penalty reductions on um, a, a judge by judge basis. But the, the clarification is helpful because the, the way the, the, the law is written, you're right, petitioner is defined as us and that's the one that has to appear in person or as authorized by oath. It doesn't change that consumers can call in by telephone. Um, and historically, there's been several reasons. I think <laughs> Chief Devaye, uh, I identified one, that there might be this um, feeling that consumers felt more comfortable. Um, years ago, when I worked at a different agency, I met with then Commissioner Matt Doss, who explained to me that they had had a very high default rate and, you know, with consumers not appearing at hearings, so they thought that that was having a chilling effect on consumers feeling comfortable filing and following through, so they offered them this phone um, option and that they found that that actually helped with the follow through rate of those consumer complaints. At the time I was at CCRB and we're very concerned with default rates there because you want to make sure complainants have easy avenues to <laughs> file um, complaints. And so he sort of told us, well, this is what's worked here, um, allowing them to come in by phone. And then there's the other complicating factor, especially in the taxi bi business, many of the consumers are tourists. They might come from different countries, so by the time it gets to the hearing, they're in Australia or wherever. They may have to wake up at a funny time, but they can still participate. Um, but any of the stuff that, because of time, I haven't been able to provide you a complete explanation, we're more than happy to follow up afterwards. Thank you, thank you yeah. so much. Uh, one quick question, and that is, how often has the TLC elected to overturn a summon decision that has been appealed to TLC after being decided by oath? Um, I, I'm glad you raised that too, because I had, um, I remember when this provision first came about, and in the first few years, um, it's the respondents that actually um, we, were appealing to us and we were hearing those and we were agreeing with the respondents, um, much to the consternation of my assistant commissioner of prosecutions, who was not happy that we were overturning their decisions. But there was a there was a wall between the two and one of the most notable reasons was because it came down to an interpretation and oath of one of our rules that we felt they were misconstruing as a very sort of strict liability when in fact they were missing the intent of the rule and because they were viewing as a strict liability they were finding drivers in violation um, and we set the precedent through the chair's petition process um, that it not be considered that way. Um, but in recent years, um, and I have the numbers here for 2017 and 2016 in my notes, um, or Chris will give them to me again. I'm so sorry, they're scribbled. It's okay. Okay, 2016 it was one and one, right? So there was one time the agency appealed to the chair and one time the respondents appealed to the chair that there, that a decision was issued and in 2017, zero, zero. For petitioners and ones for, one for the, okay. So nine from the agency relating to oath decisions when we had a rule transition. We changed to a universal license, so our two drivers licensing chapters resided in two different chapters. They were merged to chapter 80, and so there was a process by which through the chair's decision, um, we were able to give guidance to oath judges on how to interpret the chapter 80 rules. And, and so I could get you out of here to your next mm -hmm. appointment, how many uh, cases do you settle before they get to oath? Um, I think the vast majority, um, but absolutely will get you, you know, no. specific numbers on I think both about over 90%, years. percent. We say vast I think majority, but I think vast majority, I think around seventy percent. Seventy percent. Yeah, okay. um, and 
we will also send you, because we revamped the way we inform drivers about the opportunity to settle, um, much in response to concerns that have been raised by council members as well as concerns raised by drivers groups about ensuring that drivers know what their options are, giving them the opportunity to call Mohammed's office, provide us with additional evidence, and as a, as a consequence, we're able to withdraw summonses because we can interact with the drivers at an earlier point and get their side of the story in essence. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you uh, so both much. Both co commissioners, uh, thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you for being uh, here today. I know you have uh, other uh, appointments uh, to go to, and with that, we're going to call the next panel. Uh, Nino Hernias from the New York City Taxi Coalition, United We Stand, Peter M. Mazur from the Metropolitan Taxi Board of Trade, Victor Salazar from the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, uh, Subin Soleimani from the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. And uh, if I butcher your names, please bear with me. By Romy Desai. Oh, I'm sorry, man. Just, just help me here. It's been a long day. Uh, from the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. And if we need an extra chair, we could just get that blue one. We have one more here. Okay, great. I'll slide down. So uh, for the sake of time here, and thank you so much for waiting, and I also want to thank my colleagues that have been here from the very beginning. Um, commend them for being here today and for uh, their very wise questions. Uh, so we'll, we'll give you each three minutes, but that doesn't mean it's going to stop there. You know we're going to have questions, and uh, we're, we're dying to ask your questions. So with that, if you can introduce yourself, you can start. Go ahead. Hey, I'll start. My, may I? Uh, I'll start. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Government Operations Committee. My name is Peter Mazur, and I am General Counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Care Board of Trade, an association representing the owners of approximately 5,500 medallion taxi cabs. We also provide a full-service taxi cab driver center and have provided free legal representation to taxi cab drivers in about 2,500 oath taxi tribunal cases during the past two years. From 1987 through 1998, I served as an administrative law judge and as chief administrative law judge to the former TLC tribunal, and during that period of time, I estimate that I adjudicated about 25,000 cases. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with regard to uh, intro 748, which would make some significant changes to both oath and TLC operations regarding the adjudication of summonses issued to taxi cabs and for hire drivers and businesses. As a former hearing officer and now as a litigator, appearing before the tribunal on a regular basis, I fully appreciate the need for a tribunal to di dispense justice fairly and impartially. Confidence in a licensing and regulatory system is not possible unless there is complete confidence in the underlying adjudicatory process. This legislation attempts to uh, address some of the concerns that have been expressed over in uh, past and present oath and TLC procedures, and I'll take them one by one. The first is 19902, which talks about who may appear. And um, you have my written testimony. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I won't get it through in three minutes. But the, the point has been made already, and it's the, the single point that I want to make here, again, is that in, um, in consumer cases particularly, consumers can appear by telephone. Drivers cannot. And if anything comes out of this, I urge you to consider the fact that if a driver, however the, dri the consumer is going to appear, the driver should appear the same way. So if a consumer is in person, the driver can be in person. If the consumer is on the telephone, the driver should be on the telephone. If the consumer is video conferencing, the driver can video conferencing. I'm a lawyer. We have lawyers. We have reps. We can figure out how to get the evidence to the judge to make the case, uh, to b best present our case. Uh, the next one I want to deal with is 19503, which would give hearing officers uh, greater discretion to reduce penalties. And the problems I've had with the hearing officers is they don't, they don't exercise discretion to reduce penalties. From my experience, a judge 
given the opportunity, whenever there's a, a range of fines, we'll always impose the highest fine possible. The commission used to have a lot more range fines, uh, and the judges had a lot more discretion. That was taken away from them. The judges, as a rule, were basically imp imposing the highest penalties possible. The TLC already does a settlement process pre-hearing, and it works fine. I settle almost all my cases pre-hearing, and there's a reason we do that, because you get a lower, a, a lower penalty. And if I could just have a couple of minutes to finish up. Most, but not all, respondents are offered settlements. And the settlement process does work because it does provide a consistency of, of results. And I am very concerned that giving judges discretion um, would take away the settlement process. And what would happen is that drivers would no longer be offered settlements, but would have to go to the hearing, be forced to, to appear at a hearing. And if a driver is not sophisticated, he's not going to know, or she's not going to know how to put on a case and say, well, there should be a mitigation of penalty for a whole variety of reasons. A and I'm just very concerned that the judges won't know how to do it, the respondents won't know how to do it. The commission, of course, will always have a representative. The representative will ask for the highest penalty possible. They always do. That's what prosecutors do. And uh, I'm just not comfortable that it will work. Will work. Some of the other provisions, the three-hour rule, that's an, an old thing that there used to be uh, long waiting times. I don't see that as a problem anymore. One change that I would urge when you're dealing with the uh, petition to the chairperson, um, I think generally it works. I think the problem is that sometimes the, com the chairperson exercises right now her, th her authority to impose a penalty greater than that which was imposed by the oath judge. I would like to see that if there's an appeal to the chairperson that she can either uh, accept the judge's recommendation or lower the penalty but not increase the penalty above what the, uh, what the judge uh, did. And the only other thing that I want to say which is in my testimony is that we, you must have, um, the, the most important thing is that you have integrity in the process and that you have drivers and respondents who are appearing in front of a hearing and consumer, uh, consumer complainants who know that there's going to be a fair hearing. If, if we can't give everybody a fair hearing, then the, the tribunal is failing. It, and a lot of these, these changes, they may work, they may not work. The most important thing is that respondents have to know that when they walk into a hearing, that they are going to be given a fair hearing, that they have a judge that's impartial, a judge that's willing to listen to them, a judge that is going to apply the law fairly, the judge that will apply the rules of evidence and not going in with their personal biases. And I think if we accomplish that uh, through this legislation or some other legislation, that would be a, a great step forward for the city. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hi, uh, um, uh, oh, yeah. Thanks for um, Chair Carrera, uh, council members, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. My name is Zubin Soleimani. I'm a staff attorney with the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, we re represent drivers uh, in all sectors. And I just want to thank you for, uh, for looking at the issue of penalties that have for a long time not been commensurate with the earnings of this workforce. Uh, as you know, our, our, our workforce is a workforce in economic crisis right now. I believe Chair Zoshi was saying earlier that many drivers are earning below minimum wage at this time, and the penalties currently are, are out of whack. Um, that said, I, 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 um, I do have some concerns about the idea of giving more discretion right now to the ALJs. Uh, Chair Del Valle spoke earlier uh, about he, a concern that there would be arbitrary and capricious concerns about penalties. Those concerns exist for us today. Um, there are range penalties right now. I'll give you an example of you have, a, you have a penalty, you have a violation called willful acts of commission against a public interest. Um, a driver is charged with that for basically anything the TLC doesn't have a rule for already. We had a member <coughs> get charged with that violation who had severe asthma and wanted to use a, a nebulizer in his car before the trip began so he could breathe. And he was charged with acts of commission against the public interest. Now that could have been anywhere from just a $150 fine to a $350 fine and a 30-day suspension of his <laughs> TLC license. Now a 30-day suspension of your driver's license not only means the loss of the income you would have had for that month, but if you're a long-term committed driver, you still have to continue paying lease expenses of thousands of dollars during that month. So I'm not comfortable with the discretion that ALJ has right now to go anywhere from $150 to $7,000 worth in damages. Uh, and just for the record, we, this issue has been raised on appeal to the Oath Appeals Unit, and their official position is that the ALJ does not have to give any explanation for where the range in that penalties are. So our position right now is that I think 
the goals here in this legislation are laudable. Uh, a, I think a better way to look at this would be a, more of a comprehensive overhaul of the commission's penalties. Some, some penalties are set right now in the ad code for unlicensed operation, refusal, and overcharge, uh, but the rest are at their discretion. I think, um, I, I'm a proud New Yorker, but I, I think here we could look to Chicago's example. Um, Chicago a few years ago overhauled their penalties for drivers, and they have two tiers of penalties. Uh, one is a lower offense, and one is a repeated offense or a more serious offense. The lower offenses range from 50 to $100. So this could be for something like, uh, you know, I wanted to take I wanted to take Lexington. The driver took Park, right? Which right now is, is a much higher penalty. Um, the higher penalty range is anywhere from 100 to 400 dollars, and and that's it. Um, and I would I would note that I think this such a scheme would make sense in uh, the hearings division. Right now, TLC has two options to prosecute. They can go to the hearings division where the vast majority of cases are heard. Uh, or they could go to the trials division, which is more formal and drivers have more due process rights. When TLC decides to go to the trials division, they can do anything they want. They have absolute discretion to seek penalties up to $10,000 for any violation. So if there is a serious concern that maybe the, the fine, lowered fines on the books would not be appropriate for an egregious act, they always have that option. Um, another, and I'll, I'll be brief, but uh, another, another point that we would propose in, in overhauling the TLC penalties is, is that you know, we spoke earlier about this option for a fine and a suspension, is right now that discretion for the judges is that it could be either or or both. Now, it's either the fine or everything. Uh, so we would propose that the judge, that there would either be a financial penalty or a suspension. It is, ex it is extremely burdensome right now to take away a driver's ability to pay a fine and then ask them to pay that fine on top of it. Um, so I think um, just to, I, I know some folks may have some concerns about what this might do, the deterrence effect on public safety. Uh, and I, here I want to distinguish between the types of fines that might relate to customer complaints um, or, or to driving or, and those that are safety related. I, I just, I want to reiterate that right now the TLC's critical driver program, which suspends a uh, driver's license after six points accumulated in 15 months, as far as we know, is the strictest standard for professional drivers anywhere in the country. So stricter than those for current CDL holders of trucks. So I think that that framework, aside from financial penalties, would not not be addressed by any of the changes that we're discussing today. Uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable councils. My name is Nino Hervias representing a uh, coalition of traffic uh, medallion owners. And uh, well, we all know uh, the reason why we are here, uh, one agreement, the process is broken. And uh, we are here to fix it and because we deserve fairness in a due process. Council Cabrera's bill is a step to the right direction and it is urgent for us since our industry has been decimated but this totally unfair competition that we're facing today with causing irreversibles consequences like forced suicide, foreclosed, bankrupts, you name it, where I can go on, for, I mean, the whole day. Um, since uh, uh, your testimony has been well, and I, I second that, uh, on the practicality, uh, the window that is provided uh, which uh, hearings are held for three hours. I will recommend it for two hours, because I mean, for us drivers, every hour is, is an eternity. It is, it is what define actually what kind of food you're gonna bring to the table. It, and it is so important to keep that in mind. But also uh, in fairness of a hearing, uh, in practical, as I as a driver, as my friends also, they, they face it, uh, I, I see no parameters when it comes to testimonies from the respondent and the complainer or, or the officer. Uh, when there's a 50-50 uh, fair uh, statements for both, both parties, that uh, we are not given the benefit of the doubt. And uh, I don't see what, what, is, what is the guidance a judge or anybody uh, administrative uh, judge had but my only understanding is based, I believe, that they believe that every officer 
are angels. That's all I can say. So it, it is urgent, I mean, to do the best we can and, and get it right this time. I support uh, Bill 748 uh, right now. Thanks so much. Hello, good afternoon. Um, we're so pleased that you're having this hearing today. Um, my name is Beta V. Desai. I'm the executive director of the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. We have a membership of over 20,000 drivers. And as Zubin said, um, you know, when we first started in 96, we had only yellow cab members. And over the past five years, as there's been a revolving door in made of the des economic desperation where drivers are just trying to figure out which sector is gonna allow them to survive, We've, we now have a membership that works across the industry. Um, you know, of, of the, the four suicides that you know, Nino mentioned, one was by a livery driver whose suicide note was left on the back of a summons. And you know, um, it, you know it's, we can't belabor the point enough that there is a tremendous economic consequence for drivers around these fines. Um, I mean, the fact that they're not commensurate with driver earnings is really crushing. It leads to a sense of desperation. It's one thing if, you know, you, you don't have enough money for that day to go to work in terms of paying the lease or gassing up. Um, the thing is, once you lose your license, it's a permanent loss or at least it's a loss that can last for you know several years before you're, you're able to go back to work again. We're talking about a workforce that's over 94% immigrant, majority people of color. It's people coming from communities that are otherwise, you know, have limited options in the overall economy. And so when, they lo when, when a driver loses their license, it really does shut the door for you know, thousands of families for any sense of econo you know, economic viability. You know, just sustaining themselves. We've seen such a rise in eviction notices to like drivers after 60 hours of work a week talking about food shortage and hunger and starvation in the middle of a shift. You know, there's a tremendous crisis. Um, you know, some of these issues with the fines, of course, pre-exist this crisis, but at this point, it, it, it's such a heavy boulder Right, that that feels so crushing that you can't get out, you know, get out from under it, um, and and the idea that you would lose your license, a suspension or revocation, and still be expected to pay a fine that could be as much as ten thousand dollars. It's just it's it's beyond preposterous, right? It's beyond. Forget the ethics of it. How is it practical for a poor person to be out of their job for a month? or longer and still be expected to put it together that much money when people can barely scrape together their rent money nowadays. It's just not practical. And what's important here is that the TLC really regulates the economics of our industry on the yellow side. We're calling on that to be done on the FHV side as well by having the yellow cab, green cab meter rate be the wage floor across the industry so no no company can go lower. They can go higher, but they cannot go lower. And to cap the expenses on for FHV drivers, like on vehicle financing, which that exists on the yellow cab side. Um, but so, so it, you know, TLC, you know, in many ways shapes the economics. When drivers take a loss, unless the agency that regulates this industry has a stake in that loss, the reality is things will not change, right? right? We're the only ones that pay the price. That has to shift because if those in power don't share some of our grief, then we don't get heard and things simply don't change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I wanted to propose an idea here. You, we have this bill and I hear what you're saying regarding your concern about the judges, the penalties being too high. What if we have what you're proposing today alongside with this? So we're not talking about a sovereign amount of fines, which is against uh, the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, excessive <laughs> fines, right? Uh, so what if 
if we have two, the two working in conjunction with each other, where we have the model that we see in Chicago, and we have this at the same time, and yet put it in the hands of the judges, which I still believe it should be. I mean, we, we do that <laughs> with everything else. I think the reason why we have it right now and it looks so appealing is because of the 5000 You know, as the letter says, you know, $300, you know, pay $300 now, or you could be liable paying $5,000. I mean, I'll be honest, if human nature kicks in, it'd be like, here's a $300, which is very close to some of them, you know, two and a half days worth of work. And so, which is, like you mentioned, will, uh, you know, decimates uh, literally the financial stability of families. What are your thoughts on that if we have both of them at the same time? I mean, I, 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 think, with, w I think within a more limited range, uh, that, that could be appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. I, my concern would be just uh, on whom is the burden to adjust the fine. Will it be the default position of the ALJs to assume the maximum and then to be argued down from that, or vice versa? Um, and what would be or what would be the parameters to justify any changes in the? You know, would that find its way into oath rulemaking? That any any departure from either the minimum or the maximum would have to be justified, rather than, th as I mentioned earlier, there's there's you know there's there's no rationale required by the appeals unit. That that would be my concern. Yeah, for for me, the culture of ALJ should be one of making a judgment based on the merits of the case, period. And, but again, if you only have an option of this high or nothing, I, I, I'm with you, I, I hear you. And uh, we already, I, I, I went to your press conference yesterday and we are already working on some possible legislation here uh, to make sure that we have equity uh, taking place. Council Member, any questions before the next panel? Sure. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I had a question uh, for you, <laughs> Mr. Mazur. Yes. Um, you, you indicated uh, that you know, your, your concern about allowing uh, the uh, allowing the oath judge to mitigate the penalties based on these various factors that are in the statute uh, is that the TLC would no longer offer the pre-settlement process, but. Um, now, there's nothing right now requiring them to offer the settlement process in the statute as it currently is. The reason they do it is because they want to take the cash on the table uh, rather than roll the dice for later. And they're going to still, in, in my estimation, I mean, just like any other agency that at the end of the day is, uh, you know, it has a several fold process, right? Obviously, it cares about the people and it cares about the cars and it cares about the drivers, but it also has an aspect of their. Uh, of, of their bureaucracy that requires them to uh, impose penalties and collect them, they will continue doing the settlement process. I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, what I haven't got a question yet. Well, what 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 we've done, and this is this is what I will post to you, is what I believe the council is doing here is um, uh, giving the judges not as a matter of every, of course in every case, but as a matter of. Uh, as a matter for a special case, um, which is why the word may is in there, you know, for the interests of justice require, not every case requires a lowered penalty from the, from the uh, guideline penalty based in the, on the interests of justice, right? It's a special case. That's, that's why cases get dismissed in the interests of justice, because typically they wouldn't be dismissed, but the interests of justice, all things taken together, uh, given the nine varying factors that we've listed in the statute, put them all together, the judge says, uh, $1,500 penalty doesn't make sense, a $100 penalty makes more sense. You know, so what we're, what we're really doing here is we're not taking away the TLC's ability to do that settlement process. Um, do you still have, give, given the way I'm looking at it, then this is the way we looked at it, I think, uh, do you still have a problem with that? Well, here, here I'll, I'll address it this way. The settlement process is relatively new. Uh, the TLC only started the settlement process maybe two or three years ago. Before that, they took everything to hearing. Uh, and the reason they went with the settlement process, it, in part it might be for the money on the table, in part it may be judicial convenience and expediency, um, in, in part so that they, most of the types of summonses that we see are routine, cut and dry, they're not the kind of cases that you're going to litigate. Uh, let's say a, a, a taxi cab had an overdue inspection. Uh, either was inspected on time or it wasn't. 
And now the commission, through the settlement process, is offering a lower fine. So you, you could plead guilty and pay $100 instead of paying $200. Uh, on the consumer cases, they do offer settlements sometimes. Sometimes they offer settlements that are still not worthy of consideration. I have two cases on for next week that they've, the settlement offers $3,000. I'm not really, neither of my drivers are going to take those settlements. Uh, so the, the process, but, but I think that my fear, and I, and I, nothing has made me, uh, has turned away to alleviate it. My, my fear is that the TLC will turn around and say, well, well, you can go to every hearing and argue in front of the judge now for mitigation. Uh, rather than uh, going uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and having your, your settlement process. And like I've said, I probably settle about 90% of my cases. Uh, because, and I only bring the cases to trial that I feel that I'm going to win. Because there is no reason to put somebody's license livelihood at risk unless I'm very, very confident that I have a strong defense on the, on the case. So those are the only cases that we're, we're actually going to, to, to bring to hearing. Uh, and in those cases, I mean, we have a, s a reasonably good record, but unfortunately, uh, I mean, I, I almost hate to say it, but unfortunately, you, you don't know, the, the quality of, of what you get at the, at the, in the tribunal varies from judge to judge, and there are many judges that, um, when I walk into the room, I know immediately that uh, I'm going to be found guilty and I'm going to have the the maximum point because that's what those judges do. There are other judges that you don't feel that same way. And the justice isn't across the board. It isn't even. And, and yes, I understand. I, we do, I practice in traffic court. I practice in criminal court. I know that you, 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 you can say sometimes you have judges that are more harsh, more lenient, but you sh there, there still needs a lot of work in the tribunal to bring the level of uh, the, the quality is, I mean, it, perhaps it's better than it was, but the, there's still um, a, a need that, uh, that you, you really want to know that you have a, a fair hearing. And without the settlement process, if I had to bring everything to a hearing, it would be very, very difficult. And, I'm, and I, unless I knew that the settlement process was going to continue, that the TLC would continue to offer the kind of settlements that they have, um, I don't, I mean, I, I, my, also my concern, and I, I listened to what the, uh, the two uh, chair people said, and I, and I do agree that most respondents are not sophisticated enough to make a, a, a cogent argument with respect to uh, mitigation and penalties. Going for, with a lawyer, I, you know, we could do it, uh, a lawyer or, or a trained representative, but I, I don't know that a, a, a respondent is going to be able to articulate the kind of uh, things that we have. We have other processes where people come in and they have to articulate uh, how to, whether they should keep a license or not keep a license. And if they don't come in re with representation, they're, they're really at a disadvantage. When I was I'm worried about that. When I was uh, talking, thank you. When I was talking to Chief Judge, uh, and, and well, when I was questioning whatever we do here, um, uh, one of the things I talked about was the, the notion that Oath is designed as a pro se court. And he's really done more work uh, over the last four years as he's talked about with counsel uh, since the mayor came into office to really make that a more user-friendly court for the respondent side, uh, um, to make it more administratively user-friendly on the petitioner side, but also to make, to, to make it easier for a respondent to walk in there and get their case adjudicated as a pro se litigant, which most people do. Uh, most people are not able to hire an attorney to uh, represent them, and obviously drivers are included in that for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, but I think that what you're indicating is something that can be easily resolved by oath, by creating a process, you know, they can they can create a little booklet. They have dozens of booklets about the different kinds of cases they do. They can create a form saying if you need to request that the court uh, reduce your penalty, you have the right to do so for the varying nine factors, and here's the evidence that we would take to each of those nine factors. There are different ways that the court can do that, but um, to, to, not, to not give the court the ability to mitigate the penalty is the only other option that you're suggesting is to, well, is right. to excise that from this proposed statute and to say that right now, that as it stands right now, the court doesn't have the authority to mitigate the penalty and make it a lower interest of justice like $25 penalty. You want that excise from the statute? You don't want the court to have that option? Well, uh, I'll, I'll answer that in a little bit of a different way. One of the things the city council did a couple of years ago was you've um, decriminalize a lot of uh, not me 
Uh, okay. My predecessor counsel. Your predecessor counsels okay. have decriminalized a lot of offenses. One of the offenses that taxi cab drivers typically typically get is, is engine idling, which uh, under the um, administrative code was a misdemeanor, returnable to criminal court. When I used to go to criminal court with my drivers, I used to get, uh, we used to plead guilty to a public health law and get $25 fine. Now they go to oath, the minimum fine is $350 for the same offense, but it's not criminal anymore. There won't be a warrant out for their arrest if they don't show up in, uh, in front of the oath tribunal. They'll just be defaulted for $350. But is that justice? Uh, is that mitig mitigation? We've taken the same offense and made it to a $25, a, a, a de facto $25 criminal offense is now a, a $350 civil offense. Is that what it should be? Maybe it's maybe it's an engine idling is serious, and maybe they felt that uh, the criminal court judges were, were not doing. It. I understand in criminal court, of course, we mitigate all the time. We wind up there's always plea bargains. We always uh, are, are doing that. The settlement process is kind of the process that we have right now. Uh, and in past times, when the TLC was a little bit more uh, open to negotiating the settlement process, now they're much more concerned about. Being um, having a, a settlement process where everybody's treated equally, so there's really very little uh, negotiation with the TLC when it comes to settlements. It's pretty much uh, if this is a violation and this is the fine, the settlement is this, half or two thirds or whatever it is. Um, in a perfect world, I'd love to see judges have discretion to lower penalties. I'm trying to figure out how it would work. I could see it working maybe if you set up a two a two hearing process where I, uh, I did a hearing. And if I'm found guilty, and then I can submit before the uh, as a second phase, maybe before penalty, they do that um, in the oath uh, trials unit. Does that now, where they have a second a second step, where they do uh, penalty a penalty phase, maybe for the more serious violations. You could do something like that, where a two step, where if you're found guilty, the judge doesn't immediately impose a penalty, but then you have the opportunity to present uh, evidence of mitigation. Something like that might work. Talking about an entirely separate trial. Uh, that's or what second it would be. It was second phase of the trial. It second penalty phase, phase of the trial after the fact finding phase. Yeah, something talking about elongating the process by a factor of two sometimes, right? You know. Yeah, uh, are those probably in the? Uh, I, 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 I guess you're not looking to do this on a. Uh, it seems like this is going to be something that would be done sparingly. Maybe only in an interest of justice. Well, I mean, it, that's uh, but that's the point of the statute. There's that yeah. for the first time the council has actually given. Uh, the authority uh, on these kinds of cases to oath judges to look at other factors other than the penalty guidelines that the TLC puts out and and to take the you know the extent of harm caused by the violation I'm just one caught my eye right now for example on the engine idling right you know if if uh, if uh, the oath judge says $350 because you left your engine on for two minutes are you kidding me $25 is fine Right, so that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now, uh, you just ran over somebody's foot uh, because you were looking at your phone. You don't get mitigated for that. Right. And, the, and, maybe, and maybe that person should lose their license. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about is that, uh, is that the, the respondents have the opportunity to say, this is the, these are the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I was found or will be or possibly or potentially found liable of. And this, these are the issues. So if you ha intend to impose a penalty, Judge, I just want you to be aware of the following. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you have what to work with because th there are penalty guidelines. And the penalty guidelines say, so you know what you're being charged with. You know the code that you're being charged with. The penalty could be anywhere from 300 to whatever, you know, 5,000, 10,000, whatever the case may be. Perhaps 10,000 as a maximum, as an up to $10,000 fine, which is, I think, what the enabling statute allows. Is that would be is in probably yeah, something oh, that should oath, be looked at. At oath trials, that's the penalty is and, up and, to 10000 And it's, pro it's it possibly everyone. should, I mean, that's, but that's something that's done citywide across the board for a lot of agencies, the up twos. The question is whether or not the, the TLC, which is imposing the penalties, is, uh, is going up to too many times. And perhaps that's why judges who are independent of the TLC should have the ability to take other factors and look at them and say, you know, we can we can mitigate based on these factors. So just I, I two ways to look at it. There are many ways to look at it. All I right. don't know. Thank you, Mr. Don't Chair, have a Mr. No, Mr. Actually, Councilmember, I think uh, you came out with an idea that I would love to support. 
of the manual. Uh, that would be a, a very good LS request. I would love to be a co-prime with you and looking forward to, to have it task. and uh, looking forward to having a hearing on it. Now we have uh, two LS requests uh, for today, yes, uh, which is very, very good and, and put our staff to work even more for the extra staff that we're getting. Looking forward <laughs> to Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You. To the panel, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy. Please do not give up the fight because literally there are lives at stake uh, here and their families. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, we'll have the last panel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna try to read his last name, but Alex Camarda from Rio Van uh, Albany, Mark Marco Connor from Transportation Alternative, Brian Howell, uh, Kristen Johnson and Shoresh Wall. Feel free to come up. Thank you so much for waiting to all the way to the end. It means a lot. Fantastic, I think we need, you feel free to pull up that blue chair if you could just get a little closer, there you go. Fantastic, feel free to begin. And just identify yourself, thank you. <coughs> again, we'll have three minutes on the clock and then we'll have some questions. Accompanying my testimony with a slideshow of photograph I took that are basis for the complaints that I've been filing for TLC. Uh, thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Horoch Wald. I live in the East Village of Manhattan with my family. I have three children ages se seven, five, and almost four weeks old. As the majority of the people who reside in this city, I do not own a car. To transport my children to school and back, I use a cargo bike that can hold multiple children. That is an efficient way which makes zero pollution. When I ride my bicycle every day, I encounter endless amounts of traffic violations by drivers around me. One of the most prevalent and unsafe situations I observe is of drivers who block bike lanes. Two years ago, I discovered that the Taxi and Limousine Commission prosecutes drivers who violate traffic rules, so I started filing complaints online, submitting complaints along with pictures to the 311 website. TLC found that most of my complaints had merit and prosecuted them. Unsafe driving is prevalent in the city. Crosswalks are blocked regularly. Pushing a stroller through a blocked crosswalk is an unsafe and unacceptable situation. People get killed by being knocked over doors that are opened onto bike lanes. When a driver speeds at the school zone, the summons is made to the vehicle owner, not to the drivers. TLC is holding professional drivers accountable for violating traffic rules. Professional drivers use the street at a multiple higher rate than any other drivers since they drive the city streets for 10 to 12 hours a day. Reporting of unsafe drivers by street users has the only merit of an effort to create a safer city for people to live in. It is a sincere method since the complaining witness has no monetary incentive to file a complaint. No amount of money from the fine the driver pays for violating a traffic rule will go to the complaining witness. TLC prosecuting attorneys are professionals who give an excellent consumer service. They follow up on complaints and will not prosecute cases that are determined as, com as not compliant with TLC rules. Every case is thoroughly investigated. The drivers are held accountable and pay a fine. TLC has established a reasonable and fair system. The drivers have a chance to plead guilty and pay a reduced fine or go to a hearing to challenge the charges that were brought up against them. I testified in over 100 hearings in the last two years. 60% of the cases the hearing officers found the driver guilty, 40% were dismissed. The driver walked home and didn't pay a fine. This is a non-discriminatory system. The complaints are based on taxi medallion numbers or uh, FHB license plate numbers. No prejudice versus gender or race of the respondent drivers. This method of civic engagement should be lauded and, and expanded. A telephone app that was created specifically to make the compliant filing uh, process easier called Reported has processed over uh, 2,700 complaints since it was launched two years ago. I personally find 
filed a d uh, dozen complaints a day, culminating in the thousands over the years. I would like the committee to oppose this, uh, the, the, this bill since it will diminish the ability of the Tax and Limousine Commission to hold drivers accountable for unsafe driving. Today, when a hearing officer dismisses the case, the driver pays no penalty. The ability to reduce a fine by the discretion of the hearing officer in a case that he rules the driver is guilty will make the whole process meaningless. Drivers will have no incentive to settle for the half the maximum fine amount since the fine amount will be ambiguous. This method that was introduced five years ago eliminated, eliminated the old block backlog of months. Please expand the system by staffing of more prosecutors in order to reach the goal of Vision Zero, that no one human being will die on the streets of New York City because of reckless driving. Please publicize these methods so that a real change will come to the unsafe driver behavior that exists right now in the city. I want my kids to be able to walk safely in the streets. I want every driver to respect the pedestrian's right of way. Keep crosswalks, bike lanes, bus lanes, bus stops clear. I want drivers to stop unnecessary honking, respect soft lines, stop idling their engine, creating air and noise pollution. TLC holds drivers accountable for all of these violations. Thank you for hearing my testimony. So I'll try to summarize my testimony there so it's uh, as quick as possible. <laughs> So uh, my name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany, and I'm actually presenting testimony for reInvent Albany and Beta NYC today. Um, we're testifying on two bills, the Doris bill related to creating an inventory of uh, required reports under city law, and then also the uh, intro 14 um, regarding the broadcasting of candidate debates. So I'll start with the, with the first bill. Generally, we support the concept of creating an inventory of reports that are required under the law. We think that's fundamental and very important since so, much of the, uh, so many of the laws the council passes are actually reporting bills. Uh, we think the mechanics of the bill uh, need some work. Uh, in particular, we think that um, there needs to be more of an open data approach to reporting information as um, the commissioner alluded to of Doris. We think government generally needs to move away from providing information that's locked in static PDF reports and report data in an open, usable, and dynamic form, which is actually required by the city's open data law. Uh, the online table of reports on the Doris uh, website in their publications portal, um, I'm sorry, be created by this bill. Uh, should be downloadable, machine readable, and sortable by column headers like agency, date due, date last released, name of the report, and other categories. Uh, the spreadsheet itself that the bill envisions should be required to be put into the open data portal and automated so it's instantly updated. Uh, any tabular data that's in these reports that are given by agencies to Doris uh, including any graphs, charts, or tables are required by law to also be placed into the open data portal. And we also oppose the idea that Doris would spend time um, scanning and uploading reminder letters that it sent to agencies and put those into the um, database in lieu of the reports. We think that there should just be another column in the online list that reports whether the agencies did the report or not, and that a separate list should be created of all these agencies that did not complete the report. And you could look at a model, the State Authorities Budget Office does something just like this. So it creates kind of a list on their website of those who didn't meet uh, their obligation to the law, very clear and easy to read. Uh, beyond that, beyond the open data principles, we have some other suggested amendments. We think that Doris should be required to send a letter not just 10 days prior to a report being due, but at the beginning of the fiscal year to let agencies know these are the reports that are due for the upcoming year, and these are the ones that uh, you should be preparing. For, uh, for the online list, we think that the exact site in the Charter Administrative Code that requires the report should be identified, so advocacy groups can look at that and see that the report is actually met in terms of all the obligations. And we also think there should be a brief summary of the report in this table, as Doris now does in its government publications portal. 
So moving quickly on to the um, second bill, intro 14, uh, you know, generally speaking, we encourage civic participation in our democracy through the use of modern technology. We think it's much easier and cheaper to actually do webcasting uh, rather than television broadcasting. We think that that's advantageous not only because it's less expensive, uh, it allows for archiving at much lower costs, and it can be watched on smartphones, which uh, more and more is what people watch their content on these days. Uh, we do think that if um, the council does want to add broadcast channels for those who don't use um, smartphones and other more modern devices, we would encourage uh, two amendments be made to the, to the bill related to the broadcasting provisions. Uh, one is we think that the government channel, um, there's four nyc.gov channels. One is actually a government channel. We think it should be rebroadcast on that channel um, rather than the one that's most popular. Uh, there's an nyc.drive channel. Some people like to watch traffic, evidently. We're not sure it makes sense to air the uh, debates on that channel. Um, and we would also note that nyc.life, for reasons we don't understand, that's one of the channels, uh, it airs on Comcast, DirecTV, and DISH, while the other NYC Gov channels do not. So that actually reaches more people. So that might be the one channel that uh, you might want to air the debates on, or maybe all four, but we leave that to you. Thank you for your time today. Hello, come here. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the committee. My name is Kristen Johnson, and I'm testifying on behalf of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, LDF. Thanks for this opportunity to testify on intro 748. LDF strongly opposes the portion of this proposed legislation that would allow oath ALJs to impose fines below the minimum five fines for TLC-related violations. Those fines have already proven inadequate to remedy and deter the widespread and persistent problem in this city of trying to hail a cab while black. At least in ride refusal cases, those fines should be increased, not potentially lowered. LDF is the nation's oldest civil and human rights law organization. LDF's work to eradicate race discrimination in public accommodations is the legacy of the nation's civil rights laws, which historically were used to attack discrimination in public spaces schools, transportation, public accommodations, and transforming those spaces to protect the dignity of communities of color. Since our incorporation in 1940, LDF's headquarters have been located in New York City, and an additional LDF office is located in Washington, D.C. The majority of our 75-person staff works out of our New York City office, and most also reside in the city. Over 50 years ago, Congress recognized that a law was needed to vindicate the deprivation of personal dignity that surely accompanies denies of denials of equal access to public accommodations. Fifty years later, though, such deprivation of personal dignity remains routine for black New Yorkers who have experienced standing on street corners, watching taxi after taxi pass them by, or hearing the car doors lock when they try to get in, and seeing the same cabs pull over for white passengers without hesitation. This was the case for Leon Collins, who was visiting New York City in 2015 with his wife and young daughter when he tried to hail a taxi heading uptown in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood. Finally, finally giving up on his attempts to flag down a cab, Mr. Collins asked his wife, who is white, to try. A taxi stopped for her almost immediately. Mr. Collins later posted on Facebook about his experience visiting New York City, writing, today my younger daughter learned how NYC cabs are in no rush to pick up black men, especially on avenues pointed toward Harlem. It doesn't even really anger me anymore because it has always been this way as long as I can remember. This past October, LDF's director counsel, Sherilyn Eiffel, tweeted about her experience being denied service while trying to hail a taxi. The experience she described is a common one for black New Yorkers. When the taxi driver saw her trying to flag him down, he turned his on-duty light off and drove past. The TLC replied to the tweet, prompting an ongoing dialogue between LDF and TLC about the persistent problem of discriminatory ride refusals in the city. Within days of meeting with TLC, Ms. Eiffel was refused service twice more, once while leaving the LDF office in the financial district and once while leaving the staff holiday party in the West Village. Ms. Eiffel's experiences underscore the prevalence of discriminatory ride refusals in the city. Our communications with TLC during this time have been constructive, 
and also illuminating as to the extent of the problems that must be overcome within the industry. Deprivation of personal dignity is not the only harm to black New Yorkers inflicted by routine and persistent ride refusals. There are substantial economic harms as well. Missed job interviews and flights, being late for client meetings or doctor's appointments, or having one's pay docked at work. And there are black tourists whose starry visions of New York City are marred by racism. How many people visiting New York City experienced what happened to my colleague, who after waiting in the taxi line at Penn Station, had a taxi roll past her to pick up a white woman standing 20 feet behind her. The man working the taxi stand observed what happened and apologized, saying that he sees the same thing happen to black people all day. Many white New Yorkers have had the experience of securing cabs for their black friends. I've personally heard from white law clerks who would have to hail cabs in New York for the African American judge for whom they worked, and from a colleague whose desire to come to New York has diminished due to experiences of having had to ask his white boss to help him get a cab in order to not miss his flight. The consequences are particularly severe for the many black people and other people of color who live in outer borough neighborhoods without access to a subway, making them dependent on taxis and the bus system, which is arguably in an even worse crisis than our subways. Many taxi drivers, as we have learned in our conversations with TOC, will readily admit that they will refuse service to a black person because they think they might live in an outer borough neighborhood which would be less economically advantageous for the driver. As a result, the refusal of some taxi drivers to serve black customers further segregates the city and further marginalizes communities of color. It can prevent black New Yorkers from participating as full citizens in New York City life. The problem, of course, is not new, but it is now 2018 and the problem persists. Every day, black people in New York City are denied a basic service because of the color of their skin. Learning from a young age to associate the click of a cab's door locks with racial exclusion and corrosive prejudice. I'm almost done. The bill currently before the committee would give ALJs the discretion to reduce penalties, including for bias-related ride refusals, below the minimum amount set by the TOC. As we know from our discussions with the TOC and others, many drivers already consider the potential for a fine and acceptable cost of doing business, something they are willing to bear based on false and harmful stereotypes of black passengers that are widely held throughout the industry. The penalty for a first-time violation is only $350, $350, excuse me, if the driver pleads guilty before a hearing, and $700 for a second violation occurring within 24 months. Taxis operate in public spaces as public accommodations, and TLC is required to enforce policies and practices that ensure riders do not experience discrimination. The kind of discrimination experienced by black passengers resonates deeply with African Americans who still suffer the indignity of discrimination by businesses operating in public spaces. For far too long, taxi driver discrimination against black people has been an open and ubiquitous fixture, fixture of New York City streets. If the city council allows for lower penalties for racial discrimination, it'll be a signal that black New Yorkers, indeed, all New Yorkers, will hear loud and clear. At a time when openly racist rhetoric is condoned or even uttered at the highest levels of our federal government, New Yorkers pride themselves on advancing and representing values of equity, fairness, and diversity. The proposed bill is not just a step backwards, it is a statement that the daily indignities of black New Yorkers don't matter. Going forward, we should look to bold, innovative solutions that will finally put an end to racial discrimination in the taxi industry. For now, though, the decision is exceedingly simple. Saying no to a bill that will not deter people who operate a public accommodation from denying a basic service to a person based on the color of their skin. We respectfully request that the council reject this bill and support the imposition of penalties that will adequately punish taxi drivers for engaging in discrimination against black commuters in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Cabrera and committee members um, for the opportunity to testify on intro 748. My name is Mark O'Connor. I'm the legislative and legal director with Transportation Alternatives. Um, in the interest of justice and for the safety of all New Yorkers, we implore that you do not further authorize oath to reduce safety-based penalties issued by the TLC, particularly when such penalties are related to dangerous driving. Uh, we are highly sympathetic to the challenging work environments and economic situations that many for hire vehicle and taxi drivers confront as they seek economic opportunity for themselves and their families. Drivers deserve a living wage, and there are many things that could and should be done, including raising fare rates and further regulating the app-based for hire vehicles uh, that have started operating in recent years, uh, as well as ensuring due process for drivers in TLC and, and oath adjudication. Um, the Taxi Workers Alliance earlier, um, Subin Solomai uh, proposed the two-tiered 
penalty uh, uh, system, which uh, is something that I think could also be, be used. Um, but sacrificing safety and the deterrence that comes from dangerous driving penalties cannot be an option. Despite recent reductions in traffic fatalities, New Yorkers are still killed at, traffic, at tragic rates and are exposed to unacceptable dangers when simply walking, biking, or driving. Dangers that result from speeding, failure to yield to pedestrians, and distracted driving. In 2017, drivers licensed by the TLC were involved in at least 30 fatal crashes, an increase of approximately five deaths from 2016. None of these drivers, not one, lost their TLC license in 2017. Citywide, 214 people died in 2017, and since 2001, more than 5,000 New Yorkers have died in traffic crashes, with more than 60,000 people injured every year. Dangerous driver choices are the primary cause or a contributing factor in 70% of pedestrian fatalities. And in addition to the personal agony suffered by thousands of families, every injury and death results in significant economic costs for the traffic victims and the families. We estimate that the average injury crash cost each victim more than $9,000 in medical expenses and lost wages alone, costs that multiply exponentially for serious and fatal crashes. People of color and low-income New Yorkers are up to three times more likely to be struck and injured by motor vehicles and as such stand to gain the most from effective traffic enforcement by the TLC. Um, addressing this epidemic of carnage and suffering is a responsibility shared by all. Professional drivers, particularly taxi and for hire vehicle drivers, have the greatest responsibility. They spend more time in traffic and through their driving lead the way for either more reckless or safer driving by all New Yorkers. The responsibility professional drivers have for the safety of others cannot be overestimated. Professional drivers receive special training because they are operating a lethal multi-ton vehicle. The primary purpose of the TLC must be to ensure drivers operate with the highest level of diligence and comply with laws meant to protect us all. Two provisions in intro 748 are particularly troublesome. Subsections 1 and 2 of section 19903 would allow oath to consider the seriousness and circumstances and the extent of harm caused by the violation in question. Speeding and failing to yield to a pedestrian are serious offenses by professional drivers in particular. And even if the first such violation by that driver causes no immediate harm, the next offense could cause a lost life. And so the deterrence sought from the TLC issued penalty may, may occur too late if the proposed provisions of Intro 748 are enacted. Professional drivers have the highest responsibility to operate lethal vehicles on crowded city street, streets with the utmost care for the safety of us all. TLC enforcement plays a critical role in this effort, and we urge this committee to ensure that the important work by the TLC to protect New Yorkers are not diminished in your laudable and important quest for justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have one question, and I know Councilmember Barron has a question. Uh, I don't know if Councilmember Yeager has a question, but um, I find it ironic uh, that uh, you're concerned that it will go through uh, a judge to determine whether there should be a reduction when 90% of all the tickets right now are, you heard the commissioner, 90%. The vast majority, if I remember the number right, 90 or 80, something like that. But the vast majority of them, they're getting a reduction right now. So wouldn't you want uh, to go through a due process, whether you're staying before a judge, um, and the second thing to consider, I want you to think about, is the fact that most of these drivers are people who look like me and you. Uh, people of color, 94% of them are, are people of color. And uh, people are trying to make a living every day. So it, trying to find uh, that, that equilibrium, that homeostasis point, I think is very, very difficult. And this is why I appreciate uh, the comments that are being made from both sides. I I would love for both sides to get together uh, sometime. I don't know if that has ever happened, 
And if it hasn't, I would love to facilitate that. I would love to be in that room. I would love to see what it sounds like. Uh, so we could come up with laws that at the end of the day, it protects uh, people who walk down the streets every day, like yourself, who don't have a vehicle, you have chosen that lifestyle for you and your family, that it protects the drivers, that protects other drivers, uh, and at the same time, we have people that uh, could uh, uh, make a, a decent li living, especially uh, for those who are first-time immigrants uh, here in, uh, in this nation. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but then I'll turn it to Councilman Barron. Yeah, yeah, you do. Just a quick follow-up. You mentioned that most of the drivers are people of color and um, or a significant percentage. And uh, we, you know, we're we're sensitive to that and aware of that. But I think in our minds, um, to a certain extent, that that doesn't matter in the context of a finding that there was a race-based ride refusal. Um, in that context, um, I agree I, with you. You know, I, and I, so I, and this I is why I think it should go before a judge. I, I think this is why the balance of justice should take place before a judge. And right now, you have most of the cases being settled by TLC. So I find it ironic that if you want, and we heard that right now, we heard the, the uh, it's kind of a <laughs> very strange situation right here, because we, I heard the previous panelists, we're jolly taxi, which is to say, hey, we prefer the way it is right now with the, with the TLC because we get a better deal and I hear that you don't want the penances to go down and yet you don't want it to go through the judges. So I, I'm just like stuck there somewhere in between. Right, and so I'm not gonna hog the mic. I just wanna clarify, um, LDF's quarrel is not with the fact that it will be going to judges um, overall, but I think the idea that it could, it could ever be appropriate to mitigate penalties when there's been a finding of race discrimination with respect to ride refusals, that's our concern. And so we, you know, we understand the points of discretion and how it can be good in certain circumstances. And again, our focus, we're kind of laser focused on ride refusals based on race. And when there's been a finding of that, um, the idea that there could ever be mitigation um, just doesn't seem quite appropriate uh, particularly in New York City. And I'm yeah. with you 100%. I, I have experienced racism. I have experienced all of the above you have spoken about and the rejection, the shame that comes with that. So it goes beyond, you know, uh, you know the psychological effects of that. Uh, so we're not taking away, uh, you know, in this context, I don't think the intent of this uh, law will have an effect on that. As a matter of fact, I think that it will give you a greater chance because right now the TLC could say in those cases, they say, hey, just give a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, we'll settle for a hundred dollars. And there's nothing anybody else could do. As a matter of fact, you would even know. You don't even have those numbers because we don't know what it is, what they're being settled on. And we're talking about the vast majority of cases. I like to know, I like to know how many times you know, people who look like us are being rejected and, and being bypassed. We will never know that unless they, they go before a judge. Councilmember Barron, and I appreciate your comments. They're very powerful. Thank you. Did you hit the set point? Oh, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I did. Uh, if you could come uh, forward a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Howell. Uh, thank you to the committee and to Chair Cabrera thank for you. the opportunity to speak today. Since New York City adopted Vision Zero in 2014, traffic fatalities have fallen by 28% and pedestrian fatalities by 45%. In that same time, traffic fatalities nationwide have increased by 15%. The city's success in reducing death and serious injury has uh, come through a variety of methods, including head starts for pedestrians crossing the street, protective bike lanes and road diets that decrease vehicle speeds by narrowing roadways, and speed safety cameras around 140 city schools that have reduced speeding by 63% as children go to and from school. Despite these clear successes, a vocal minority of drivers impugns these efforts, calling increased enforcement of the city's traffic safety laws a scam. Despite the fact that these measures were introduced to improve safety, and by nearly every standard have improved safety, this minority persistence 
disingenuous claims that the city is merely saving lives and preventing injury to its citizens in a nefarious scheme to collect revenue from drivers. The legislation proposed today seems to be born of a similar spirit. Reducing administrative delays for driver's license by the Taxi and Limousine Commission is a worthy goal, particularly given that drivers cannot earn wages while attending hearings. However, it is crucial to remember that these hearings are often the results of driver behavior. I have participated in about 15 TLC hearings, each the result of a driver attempting an unsafe turn or swerving into my lane and nearly hitting me or parking in a crosswalk or in a bike lane or sometimes even on the sidewalk. Every hearing in which I have participated is lost time for drivers that they could have avoided by simply driving responsibly. The oath process as participated in by the Taxi and Limousine Commission provides an opportunity to hold drivers accountable for unsafe behavior that places everybody at risk of injury or death. Every day, each of us witnesses countless drivers speeding, blocking intersections, blocking crosswalks, running lights, etc. Most of the time, we are powerless to seek redress for these dangerous actions, but fortunately, the oath hearing process gives us that opportunity for at least some of the drivers on our streets. Ideally, the process would be expanded to all drivers. This process exists to demand accountability and promote safety, but you wouldn't know that from reading the text of this proposed bill. The word safety appears only once and only as an item to be considered when a judge or hearing officer weighs whether to lower, but not raise, a penalty issued against a driver after a guilty finding. The failure to consider this ro the role this process plays in reducing future dangerous behavior by drivers is evident in the last sentence of the bill's summary. Quote, the purpose of this legislation is to alleviate the administrative and financial burdens that livery drivers subject to oath hearings face. The sponsors of this bill seem to see the oath hearing process mainly as a burden on TLC licensed drivers from which little public benefit is derived. I urge the council members sponsoring this bill to protect all New Yorkers, and I urge them to remember that the true traffic victims are those who are injured and killed on our city streets, not those to call to answer for the dangerous behavior that causes it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and again, thank you for your patience, um, Brian, for, for waiting all this time. Council Member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, before I begin, I just want to say in full disclosure, uh, Kristen Johnson on the panel is my daughter in love, mm -hmm. or as the legal term calls it, daughter in law. She is married to my oldest son, and she is the mother of my two grandsons, mm -hmm. Solomon and Osa. Thank you. And uh, I just want to have that full disclosure. And that's why I know she's a woman of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because my son was smart enough to snatch her up. Uh, there are some very interesting points, I think, that were raised in the testimony from the Legal Defense Fund, particularly talking about racism and the race-based uh, policies that we see when people of color, yourself included, as you've indicated, are bypassed by taxis, black cars, or whatever, by the taxis, really, that uh, turn off their signs and refuse to pick up those persons. It's historic. It may be that there's a large percentage of drivers who are people of color, but we know that every institution in this country has got systemic racism built in from its beginnings because this country began with those same kinds of racist beliefs and they are documented in the founding documents of this country. So there may be that there are drivers of color who pass by passengers, would-be passengers, because they are people of color. But that's because they have adopted that same policy. I'm going to go to a neighborhood that's going to be far removed. I'm going to go, I'm not going to get as big a tip as I might get in other instances, and for other reasons that they bypass these people. So the people who, that are waiting to be picked up, that would like to be a, a passenger taken to their destination. We used to say in my community uh, years ago that if you saw a yellow cab, oh, that's someone who's coming from a trip and coming back via plane because you didn't see yellow cabs in the black community because they didn't, they didn't go through the black community. They were at airports where they would be uh, given a customer who came to the community. So you did not see yellow cabs in my community, and I've always lived in a black community grew up in Fort Greene, now I'm living in East New York. The fact that there's a provision perhaps in this proposal that would allow people who violate 
the conditions of, of the agreement, which is to take, pick up customers regardless of any kind of uh, discrimination, and that there's a provision that would reduce the penalty, sends a very clear message, black lives don't matter. You don't have to worry about paying a $350 fine. It'll be recorded as a fine that's less than that. And why is it less? Because the conditions under which you violated your contracts are less important because these are people who are black. So I'm very concerned about this, and I think that if this bill can be revised to bring some consideration to certain types of violations that would not be reduced, that that would be something that would perhaps make the bill uh, more effective, and as well as the issues that were raised in terms of certain safety violations that might also be uh, reduced, minimized, because it would be a part of the uh, provisions of this bill are also a great concern. So I just want to say that um, it raises some very serious issues, as is identified in the extended testimony, and sends a very wrong message. Oh, it used to be that if you were passed up because you were black, you had a $350 fine. But now don't worry about that. It won't be that high. It'll be lower. So I think it's a very significant piece. It's a very real issue. It's still existing. And I think we need to look to see how we might make an adjustment to the bill based on the fact of uh, some of the safety issues that were raised as well. Thank you so much, Councilman Barry. And I, the one thing I love about hearings, and I know we, we've been in government for a while, is that uh, it makes bills better. Right. And so I'd love to sit down with you and see how uh, we could have a bill that would demonstrate the highest level of justice. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay. Council Thank Mayor you. Yeah. So with that, I cannot believe it. Uh, we have arrived to the end. I want to thank the staff again who so uh, wisely and strategically put uh, uh, and prepare us uh, for this hearing. They're simply amazing to work with. And I want to thank the advocates for your voice. Uh, I want to say every word that you have spoken, we are going to take into consideration. We want to make this uh, the best possible bill uh, and do right by all of our citizens. Thank you so much, uh, and see you into the next hearing. Thanks.